Okay, All cool. right. Good deal. Let's get into it. All, All right, right, guys. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have Cheyenne, also known as Uncle Chet. He has been around. Um, shoot, we've known we've known each other for probably four years now. He, maybe longer. Yeah. I mean, it I goes quick. A long time ago with with Garrett, the first time. Yeah, we went out to um, we went out to your house out in um, Gilbert, Arizona. Arizona. Mm-hmm. Garrett kept calling it um, Scottsdale. <laughs> no, he kept calling head. it even worse. It was um, Glendale or something. Oh, dude, yeah. Or if he called it Mesa. Oh my god. Yeah, he kept calling it something like that. But uh, dude, where have you been? I feel like I, I got these comments. They were like, "Where's uh, where's Chet been? Where's where's Cheyenne? What kind of YouTuber doesn't post this much?" <laughs> This kind. <laughs> I was like, I don't think he's really a YouTuber. <laughs> I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't classify myself as anything, really. I would say if I classify myself more retired, right? Yeah, retired. But, is that what you would call it? But lately, I, I told you, I showed you, I have a, we're, we're going to have Hillbilly Chet on right now. I don't know if you guys can see this. You yeah. Focus on me? It, it should. Yeah, he's, he, uh, he chipped a tooth just to come to Florida. <laughs> he felt like he had to to hang out with I literally uh, almost missed my flight because I had to have him glue it back on. As soon as I got on the flight, uh, it broke when I was eating. Mm-hmm. It broke off again. So I have it. I'll put it back in. Oh, all right. Perfect. You just keep that in your pocket? Yeah. I just follow, oh, right. good deal. It's, uh, I got my grill. Look, I'll show you. I got my grill. See? Now I'm like a whole different guy. Oh, there you go. You kind of, uh, you classed up a little bit on us here. I did. I, I am from Old Town Cottonwood, Arizona, which is like Glendale, all those places. Yeah. So I know how to blend in well, just sometimes too well, you know. But, uh, yeah, I got my, my grill pimped out. Uh, Parker, he probably made fun of me every other time I saw him about my, uh. my teeth were getting a little worn down. They were nice, but they were getting worn down, and uh, they were going to crack. So I was like, you know what, let's just... Dentists will now. do that, and then they'll hit you with a big bill. Yeah, I'm definitely an anti-dentite. I will say that, <laughs> dude. When I met, hey, when you came out, when we met, uh, when I met you guys, I made a joke about that to your brother, and he was like, "Why? Why would you even say that?" Like he was really defensive of yeah. it. Yeah, and I was like, "It's from a Seinfeld episode." Just being an anti-dentite, I didn't even know it was like it's not even a real word. Well, and then he makes himself <laughs> look worse by just immediately attacking his HOA oh, <laughs> in the first. He's such two an antagonist, of- <laughs> dude. Does he mess with you before? With, I'm sure he has. Oh yeah, he's constant. Yep. He's a freaking menace to society. Yep. I mean, he was my dentist for a little bit, but um, and it was scary. He was fairly new. I had my whole office going there. They all seemed to like him, other than the touching. He so did he was touching. your dentist down in Arizona, Arizona and yeah. then he just abandoned you guys. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I had him come, and he was. I declared him as the main dentist for my whole office. I said mm-hmm. I got a really great guy. Um, and you guys, we should all just go to him. So I think he probably had four to five, 10 clients. I don't know how many. I think everybody kind of signed up with him because, you know, dentists, I don't know where everybody else is, but we don't really lock in with a lot. Like, I, it just seemed like my whole office was like, oh, I don't have anybody right now. Yeah, it's not really a thing that people think to like. Yeah, when I was have a kid, a primary we had it. dentist. Yeah, it, we did when I was a kid growing up in a small town, but not in Phoenix. You can just go anywhere, wherever your insurance yeah. goes. Well, let's get, um, I want to. Who? Who is Cheyenne anyways? Like, what do you, what do you do? Kind of, where did you come from? I feel like for people that just watch all of the channels, you were just like this guy that showed up with a bunch of nice cars and then somehow became a detective at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) And then I will find missing people. Yeah. We were like, what is this guy up to? He's, he's putting his uh, Tesla underwater. He's, he's hunting down missing people across the the country. Idiot. Honestly. So what would you kind of describe yourself? You know, elevator pitch. Uh, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about this because I like it when my friends and stuff call me Cheyenne. So that's like a nice thing. You know, if I know you call me Cheyenne, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then, but I've never told people that. So everybody, all my buddies still call me Chet, but it's kind of weird. Like my family's like, why? I mean, I get your name, but that's not your name. I'm like, I know it's like a whole funny thing. It's a nickname for my friends and it's stuck, you know? And it's like a fairly new nickname. People don't yeah, realize. Yeah, it's only a couple of years. James it's, did it on a road trip. Yeah, James made it up one oh, day. Oh, you were on that one. You yep. were on that one. Yeah, yeah. The on one Rocky Mountain Race Rocky Week. Mountain. When I was with in Ruby, you were in the uh, Porsche at the time. I think. Oh, or I did. Or were you yeah, in the Lambo? The it made no, 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 I had the Porsche. I had the Porsche and the I had my ex-girlfriend with me. Yes, that seemed yeah. like a fun ride. <laughs> <laughs> if I could have swapped out every day. I think I swapped out with Brent. 
which I, he could have rode with her the rest of the time, <laughs> other than him driving 200 miles an hour in my cars. Yeah. But, I mean, um, that, yeah, that was... Uh, so, uh, elevator pitch, <laughs> you... Okay, yeah, back to the... Uh, back to that. Um, I'm a young 39... <laughs> No, I just turned 45. Young snapper. I just turned 45. I forgot I was 45, 44 the whole year last year. I say I was 43, but I was really 44. I forgot. And then uh, I, uh, born and raised in Arizona. Um, I say from pot smoking hippie parents. Uh, my dad delivered me in the house he built in Cottonwood, Arizona on 3rd and Pinal. Okay. And uh, I was, yeah, born and bred, small town, Cottonwood, Arizona. Cottonwood is close to Sedona, where all the Red Rock commercials were shot for, like, uh, car commercials. Everybody would kind of recognize those Red Rock area. Like, yeah. it looks like Utah and stuff up there. Okay. Is that where that concert hall is, Red Rock, then? That's, no, that's actually up behind um, um, the racetrack we go to in Colorado. Oh, all it's right. up. It's, like, literally right behind it. That, Interesting. That yeah, Red it was just area. my brain went to Red Rocks, and I was assuming. There is a vein for all the geologist yeah of levels of the earth and there, that red rock goes across the whole continent so there's areas across the continent of yeah, the red that, rock that concert but, hall seems awesome yeah and all the red rock areas are beautiful so so sedona is like the area i tell people i don't know where i'm from makes me feel a little bit more high class a little less you know ghetto cottonwood um and and you know and that's really the only place people know up there besides like flagstaff i went to college in prescott I was, uh, well, I was a firefighter, paramedic for a little while. I went to college, got my degree in paramedicine and uh, fire science. So that's what all I wanted to do out of high school, man. I, was, I played a lot of football and sports and then uh, kind of ran out and I wanted to just be a firefighter, you know? So that's what I did for a long time until I was like early 20s. Uh, and I started working as a paramedic and I just... I liked a lot of the guys. I just didn't like the politics of like paramedicine and the way it worked with the fire departments. And you're like the shit below the shit, you know, it's kind of paramilitary. And I was kind of the type of guy that was okay with that. But when people took advantage of that and they wanted to kind of bully you around, it really turned me off. And I'm like, I'm 10 times smarter than this captain on this call trying to help out people. And just because he's so arrogant, I had to do not so good at medicine when I was helping people. So they would bully you around as a... As a booter. As, as like a, a paramedic would get bullied around by like a captain of fire, well, fire well, captain or like... Yeah. Who the heck bullies? I didn't realize well, I it know. was... Well, in Arizona, every state's different. So you have your EMTs and then you have your medics and the medics are higher than the EMTs. It's like a nurse compared to a tech. And so uh, I would run and I was like on an ambulance, for example. I'd show up to a fire call and there would be a captain there who wasn't even a paramedic, but he runs the call all the time. Well, yeah. as a medic, and I'm the shit below the shit, can I cuss a little bit on here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would be um, low ranking, but on that call, I was top ranking because I would have to tell people what to do for the medicine, like how we would treat patients. Well, sometimes I didn't like the little lowly young medic punk telling them what to do, and they would just do a lot of weird stuff afterwards, like just punish you in weird ways. And um, I just didn't like it. So I... I got through all that at 20 something years old and I, and I said, I'm done, I'm gonna leave. My family freaked out and I started doing mortgages. Uh, this was before 09, before the boom like crash back yeah. then. And uh, I did very, very well. I didn't had a everybody in right before the crash. Dude, <laughs> that's how it always is, right? Like this is kind of a pre-crash too, right? Yeah, especially in Arizona when it was oh, kind it was of a bad. booming market. That movie, the What's that movie with? The Big uh, Short. Big Short. Yep. That was exactly what was going on. I mean, I literally got, I got mortgages for strippers. Like it was yeah. crazy. No doc, no nothing. It was, <laughs> it was a heyday. And There's a comedian that talks about doing the same thing. Who selling does? mortgage. Who does? Tim Dillon, a comedian who oh, okay. talks about yeah, selling yeah. mortgages <laughs> on Long Island the same way. <laughs> it was crazy. But like, I got a lot of referrals and I had a great network because I was a firefighter, so I had all those guys, right? Yep. And then they would like to go to their people and the police and all those guys. And I was oh, very super honest. tight-knit community. Yeah, and I was very, very honest and I would really shoot it straight with people and they it did very, very well for me. So I was, I was top producer in my company, the company I worked for, and did a very, very good job. I was kind of excelled. And then I got bored of it and then 09, 08 hit 
And uh, man, I foreclosed on six homes. I lost everything. My credit went down to 400. Um, so you yourself had six mortgages as well. Oh yeah. So I was you were killing in it. it. I <laughs> was <laughs> deep. Every dollar I made, I put it as a down payment for another house uh -huh. I bought. And that was the thing, like reinvest yourself, grow, 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 yeah. use bank money, and you can become a millionaire on bank money. You don't have to make a million. Debt, and it all was the thing that Dave Ramsey blowing. talks about. I'm not sure. Doing. <laughs> all the things that he says not to do. Yeah, exactly. Now. <laughs> Take now. out all the debt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you did it right, you could make it. I remember, um, fast forward to the industry I'm in now, which is Air Ambulance, that owner, he got a start from credit cards and he gambled. He pulled out a million dollars in credit cards that he scammed to be trick credit to get him a million dollars. He pulled all the money out on it, started a company, an Air Ambulance company, got a jet, did everything based on a concept he knew he could probably get paid by insurance companies. And uh, he made it back a million fold and sold that thing for 80, 90 million after I left, you know, oh, wow. so it, it, it took off. So he leveraged himself, but he would have bankrupted. And he had an exit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, making so the exit is, is that's probably the, the smartest move he looks back on. The next move when you start doing well is be thinking about your exit. Yeah. Even if it's gonna be a long ways out, be thinking of how you can exit your company and it really helps you um, grow your company in the right direction and uh, it will start guiding you in the right direction um, if that's what you want to do down the road way before you're even thinking about it and that transition of selling or cashing out someday will become a lot easier. Yeah, sure. so many companies force themselves like I have to be here mm -hmm. or else if mm -hmm. I'm not here 12 hours a day it's all going to fall apart. I call that working in First gear at you know ten thousand RPM, and uh, I, I mess with Chris at Prime all the time. Mm -hmm. I think he's trying. He's gotten some more guys. Oh, I love all the guys that work there with him. But he uh, has he been on here yet? No, I've been trying. He's too dang busy. Yeah, because he is in first gear. Every time I talk to him, I'm like, out. "Hey, you ever hear the word no?" <laughs> He tries to tell me you know Never. all the time, and I won't. I, won't, I, won't I know. <laughs> I tell him that, but I'm like, not to me. Yeah, <laughs> don't say no to me. Yeah, not to me. I'm saying for your health and other things going yeah, on. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the shirts, all my shirts, he designs all of them, him and his crew. Yep. And I got to get on about it, and they're like, oh man, because you know they don't charge a ton for that. You know, so it's kind of side small work. But um, I talk to Chris all the time on yeah. like a daily basis, almost. Oh, yeah. And kind of. <laughs> He's always going 100 miles an hour, exactly. man. He's in first gear. And that transition to get to second and third gear is a real test of like, is it going to work or not? Because you can do it for a long time as a young buck. And like like Garrett, we've seen grow and he's got people now, which is amazing because it was just you two. It literally was you two. That was it. And it was first gear and you guys were doing a million things and I would worry about him burning out. Like, I'm like, dude, you're young. You can do this for a while, but you're going to be gray at 30. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's like that stress that you're in for a long time and don't do what I did, you know, with my stuff. I did that for a long time. And, uh, he's finally hitting those other strides. You it's know? tough in this industry. Cause like you have to be the face of it. Like even oh, yeah. like with True. me, no matter how big I get, like you my name's there. kind of on the thing. Like, yeah, it's a tough deal. Like mm -hmm. you, you have YouTube in the best way I think it could be done mm. for fun. Yeah. 100%. For enjoyment, yeah. the videos you want to make, you yeah. can take three months and, you know, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. That's where it kind of, that's where peak YouTubing comes. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah, it can. And I, it's not the best for the algorithm. No. It's not best for my fans. They bug me all the time. I, I, I'm proud of my product. I think I've done a good job with the product. Yeah. And, um, uh, the downside is, yeah, I piss a lot of people off. Like, how dare you get me into your channel? And then now you're. <laughs> I don't you're agree, though, that break. it's bad for the algorithm, because <laughs> if you look at Whistle and Diesel, he's done yeah. great with long. He's pauses. another monster, though. Yeah, he's a monster. But his algorithm doesn't seem to be affected by like a long yeah. month. Pause, no, it doesn't. Basically. No, no. He can do what the hell he wants right now. Yeah. yeah. And you can kind of think about the same, like just do yeah. what you want, not try to make a video to make a video. And it right. Kinda... I definitely got into that for a little while. I'm like, oh, I got to get the content out. The times like if I did a raffle or a giveaway, like I did a yeah. couple small ones. Um, I definitely was like, crap, man, my style of do what I want, when I want, I need to have these in the bank. I have to have some videos ready to go to help promote. Yep. Because I went like two weeks when I did the first one side by side, I had nothing for two weeks, like absolutely nothing. And um, 
I was struggling with my camera guy at the time. He wasn't around as much and, you know, he's no longer with me. He moved to San Fran and, you know, family and his life changed. But that was a difficult thing for me where uh, I just couldn't film when I needed to. And I started thinking about that, like, oh my God, I gotta get something out. And I got sucked into it, but I learned. And I think when I come back, cause I will come back pretty you know, good here in a little while, uh, I'm definitely gonna have some things in the pipe. And I always have ideas. I always got tons of stuff going on in my mind, yep. but um, I definitely will, I will come out swinging when I come back. I'm not gonna just, you know, half ass it. Yeah, it's tough because like your style, you want to have a cameraman, you want to do it professionally, you want an editor, you That's don't want to just like vlog style, run and gun like mm -hmm. we, what we all do. And right, it's different. It's tough. It's it's because mm -hmm. you can't make a quality video when you film it yourself. Oh on, god, no, about, so like, hard. Just point at yourself. Like yes, you can make good videos, but you're not going to mm -hmm. make like a cinematic video. Yeah, I would definitely with say a storyline and a plot. You know, I haven't done it for a long time. You have definitely been around a lot longer. Everybody around me has been around a lot longer. But I will say the one thing I did with the and you can vlog with it is the microphones. Sound is right along line the video. To me, they go hand in hand. Yep. When you have good sound and JH did it. He started shooting videos with this DGI uh, yep. uh, mic and he could be clowning around like he is a big old idiot out in a field and him and his buddy, Justin, and uh, it sounds and feels like a, a, a real TV show, yeah. like a real reality show. Once so, you had good audio, unfortunately oh. ours probably has a an AC in the back, but it's Florida and it's hot, so. <laughs> have you shot any of these yet and you didn't have a recording? No, not yet, <laughs> thankfully. I've done a couple. But yeah, so sorry if there's a little AC humming in the back. It's hot in here. Yeah, but, we gotta have it going. Yeah, so um, <laughs> yeah, we are back to your air ambulance then. Okay. Where you saw this guy do air ambulance, which right. everybody kind of needs a mentor that is showing sure. you what's kind of going on because yep. you probably would have never thought not in a million, I didn't even know it existed. Yeah. I, so I lost everything, right? I'm really depressed. I was at the low point of my life. I thought I had made it. I was doing a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. You know, I was like the most richest person I knew yeah, besides other people ago. that were up there, you know, and the, where I came from, you know, my parents made 80,000 combined their whole life, you know? So like, it wasn't, I was doing really well. I lost it all. It was a hit to my pride and my ego. And I was really depressed. And I, I went and got my paramedic back. I, re, I let it go during mortgage time, which was, you know, you say a mistake, but I don't believe in that. I think it's just what you do after you fuck up, after you mess up, is if you, uh, <laughs> um, it's what you do after that, right? Yeah. It, it, you can have as many mess ups in your life. It's just what you do after can really define who you are and what you're gonna accomplish yeah. in life. And that's what I did. And I, I was very driven. And I was like, I'm a loser right now, but I gotta get a job, I gotta make money. I went and re-got my medic back, which was a nightmare, and got it. And then I started doing wildland firefighting stuff where the people understand, you have wildland out here, that's called urban interface. So you have all the wildland fire out in the world. And then when it, when it comes into you know, housing communities, that's when it becomes a really big problem. And that's kind of the, the private company I signed up with would basically send medics uh, with the crews of big firefighter groups and everything else. And then I would go on a fire scene, um, wilderness fire, fire stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I was the medic taking care of the crew. So I would drive my own vehicle, my own land, uh, my land cruiser, which I love, 260,000 miles. I sold it for 10 grand. I could probably still buy it for 10 grand yep. today. Last forever. <laughs> I love that thing. Nuclear war, I that thing's still in gonna roll. I love that thing. <laughs> and then uh, I, I basically uh, started doing that and I, and I was thrown back in the fire. I hadn't done mortgages for eight, I mean, medicine for eight years. And I mm -hmm. got my, and I'm like out on a fire scene taking care of 300 guys in the middle of nowhere. And we got, bad burns, lacerations, everything from that to like just blisters on your feet, right? Yeah. Now I'm back in control. A lot of smoke like, inhalation stuff. Oh yeah, you get weird, weird stuff out there. A lot of like just the elements, that's the most dangerous thing, broken ankles and hurting yourself out in the wilderness. Oh you know? yeah, just like back, athletic style Yeah, injuries. back and knee and all that. So 
worst is when people do get trapped in the manzanita and you got to get them out and they cut them out and rip them out from fire burning. I mean, we had a big tragedy. They made a movie about it years later at Granite Mountain where the guys just got caught in the wrong spot. Their, their spotter wasn't watching or something, I think. And they got killed in this little area where the fire just ran up on them. But so, yeah, I was a medic for that. I did that for a couple of years, just part time in the summer. But it was great money grab. I could make three or four thousand dollars a week uh, come in and then I would be gone for a couple of weeks. And then my biggest draw, though, was like I had a kid at the time and she was a, she was really young and I like to get back home. So I was like, this is cool money. It's only seasonal and uh, I need to find something else. And a guy I met on a fire scene called me one day. He's like, hey, uh, do you want to fly? Can you fly in a couple of days? I just got a new job at an air ambulance company. Um, can you fly with us? I was like, sure. I had no idea what he's talking about. And I'm thinking EMS, like 911 fly on a helicopter. Yeah. He goes, well, meet me at the airport. I'll give you a, a run through. Um, and he saw me working on the fire stuff. I had, a, I had a call. We had like a scene there one time where I had to really help out. And he saw my management skills. And he was really impressed by that. So then he gave me the call. And he thought I really knew what I was doing. I had no idea. It was on a jet. <laughs> They found a suit that fit me, like a onesie. I found like pictures. A, like a nice jet? Like yeah, a, like a, a Lear 35. Yeah. Yeah. They're older chassis, but they're nice inside. They're like mm -hmm. an ambulance inside. Oh, okay. So I do a walkthrough. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know what this is. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's I'm the thinking, thing. I didn't even know this existed. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> yeah, cool. So then the next day, I uh, hopped a flight, flew up to Idaho, and then flew over to like Illinois or something, and then flew back home three days later after we didn't get any more you know, flights from hospital to hospital is what you do with those. You go to the airport, you get an ambulance, you go, to the, you go to the hospital, you pick up the patient who needs to go across the country for whatever reason. I need to go die with my family in Florida and I'm here in Arizona. I was on vacation in Arizona. I got hurt in a car accident. I'm paralyzed. I'm on IV therapy. I'm on all these things and I can't just be driven back to Illinois. So yeah. they call us and then we load them up in a jet, fly them to the other state or wherever mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that they're transported. It's me and a nurse, a medic and a nurse. And we'd take care of their medicine along the way and treat them and do whatever. Oh, wow. So that was what I started doing for not that long, man, like maybe a year and a half, two years. And the owner there was kind of a lunatic, the one that made a lot of money. Yep. And he was like, um, showed me the billing and he's like, dude, I was like, there's no way you're making a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars per flight. Cause I saw one of the bill, yeah. the bills that went out. And he's like, no, it's it's valid. He goes, he's kind of being braggadocious about it. Well then a couple months later, I would work in the office all the time. I was working like 80 hours a week. I would fly and come home and work in the office and do manage phone calls. And he was because we're really small. And he's like, uh, do you want to help out with the billing department? I have $10 million locked up and bills that are not being paid. I hired the best um, 911 biller in the state who worked for a big airbag company. And I headhunted her and brought her over. She's like 200 grand a year and she can't get paid on anything. You used to work doing loans and stuff and I bragged about how good I was at getting yeah. people with bad credit approved and I would hustle the system. He goes, can you do that with um, insurance? I was like, well, give me a couple files, I'll read it. And I remember reading through them all and kind of found some loopholes and realized what she was doing was 911 billing. This was a whole different style of billing and you had to have different type of paperwork and a different type of buttons to push with the insurance companies and all this stuff. And within like a month, I made them a million dollars. It was crazy. Just from making the right phone Cle calls. Cleaned up, yeah, and saying the right the, things. the right levers. And pushing the right buttons and it worked. And I remember thinking, you know, I, I remember thinking like, yeah, I got this, you know, but inside I was like, there's what the hell am I doing? And he's like, you want to keep doing this full time? And I'm thinking, oh yeah, I'll do this now. I'll stay home with my daughter and I won't have to fly no more, which I was really uncomfortable with. I didn't know all the equipment very well, like yeah. the, the ventilators and the drip systems. That's not something you do as a medic very often. Yeah. That's like, you need like a nurse basically. Oh yeah. That's what the nurse did. Yeah. yeah like you actually, it's not like a emergency at that that's point. not a thing we learn it as medics when you need to but i didn't know i just kind of bs that I yeah knew. like i would have failed a test if i had to because most people that are in there are probably non-emergency at that point no it's They're called a general like, transport mm -hmm. and it, the medical necessity is not emergency the medical necessity is this hospital can't provide me with the care i need the mm -hmm. hospital across the country can they're a specialist in that heart disease and they need to be there and they can't go by ground was there is there just like a lot of like 
standard, like, oh, there's one burn center or there's one like there used to be now they're everywhere. Standard routes of like, oh, we do a lot of to this place. Yeah, they're specialties. So you have specialty cares all across the country. Now that's the new thing the last twenty years. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a heart center, has a cancer center. And um yeah, so like they need to go uh, there's aortic dissections for certain Marfan syndrome is the best in Cleveland or it's the best in Houston. And Houston does something then different than Cleveland now. So you have to get insurance to approve one or the other. And they like to go to Cleveland because it's cheaper, you know, mm -hmm. it's closer. So you have to figure out with insurance before you even get them on the plane. Oh, 100%. Yeah. A lot of it is, and in our industry, I they have- I kind of got them in the door and then you're like, we'll get the money later. Mm -mm, mm -mm. You'll go bankrupt. And that's kind of what he was doing. He was getting all these flights because he's very confident that he knew how the billing system worked. He saw his mentor taught him that. And it was like a little secret. Not many people knew how to do that. He was one of probably five people in the whole country. And I became number six. Like there was nobody doing it. And everybody was doing it for their own little companies. And nobody liked to talk about it. I don't even know why mm -hmm. the guy ta taught him. Probably to help him as an assistant in billing. Well, uh, insurance definitely doesn't want to pay anything. Naturally. Um, the system is set up to make denials like clockwork and you'll get denied 99% of the time you submit a bill to insurance for a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar flight. You will get denied 99% of the time, the first go around. And that's what stops a lot of people. They don't know what to do. And then they bankrupt their air ambulance company that they invested a million dollars in, you know? So, um, I, I was just in the right place at the right time, had the right skill set as a medic and as a person that was like, won't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even believe that I could get paid like that. I never saw the checks. And then he brought me in one day and said, hey, you just got 400,000 on that check, on that one. And hey, you got 60,000 on this one. And I was like, all right, cool, cool. You know. So he's like, you wanna do it? I said, yeah, sure. I could be home with my daughter all the time and uh, not fly. He goes, well, you need to fly a little bit. So I ended up doing all these extra jobs for the same pay. And I was very stressed out, but making him millions of dollars. It was crazy. It was like, I figured it out. I figured out all the buttons to push. Yeah. I knew what I was doing and uh, I quit because he was just a nightmare of a person to mm -hmm. deal with. I, yeah. I always tell this story. He, he compromised my morals and ethics pretty bad. I was broke and I justified it because I was broke and I needed to put food on the table for my daughter and, and our living situation was pretty bad. We were bouncing around, uh, renting and everybody was, remember back then everybody was foreclosing. So I would rent a house. Well, the freaking owners would foreclose and then you would get kicked out because they foreclosed and nothing to do with me. Yeah. So then the bank would have it and they were and they like, did, we're selling they, it. Get, yeah. They get rid of you. Yeah. Well, Obama came in, I think it was 08 yep. and said, uh, or whatever, whenever he got in, he changed the laws and said, you can't kick people out. If they have a contract, you have to allow them to live there. And I remember hustling the system. And I got the bank to let me live there for another year before I got kicked out when I was starting my company because I had nothing, you know? So I turned it into my advantage after a while, but it, for I got kicked out of three places because people foreclosed on me. It's yeah. crazy. So I wanted to stay home with my daughter and do something. And I, uh, I said, I'm, I'm gonna quit. But oh, the, the moral and ethic thing was pretty bad. The example was, hey, uh, can you get this flight approved for this guy? Uh, he just needs to go from point A to point B. I was like, okay. So I, I'm working on it for like a month. Um, and literally that night I got a fax in, I see it, it says, we're good to go. Uh, you're approved to do the air ambulance flight per Blue Cross Blue Shield. So I, I go in, I tell my uh, boss, I was like, dude, I got it approved, bro. This is like a $300,000 flight. Like it's pre-approved, which means it will pay, right? Yeah. And uh, he was super excited and I called the family and they're like, Oh, we, we transported midnight last night. We had a, a angel flight network, did it for free. And it was a bunch of awesome people and they did it for free. I was like, well, you know, God bless you, man. That's awesome. I'm yep. so glad you got where you need to be and your, your husband's home. Right. So I go and I tell about, I was like, man, good news is they got there. Bad news is we're, we're screwed. The flight's over with. He goes, what's their number again? So I gave him all the contact information. He goes, I want to call him. I was like, okay comes back on my desk, has all the documents signed, has the flight notes signed of the actual flight from the angel flight. Yep. All the family signed and it says that we did the flight. Okay, so people are like, oh my God, what did you do, Shai? Sounds I submitted like that bill for my company as if we did it. Complete mm -hmm. total fraud, right? And it was for a lot of money. And 
I'll not ratting myself out. I'll tell you how that all went later on. So then I fight with the insurance company. I'm excited. I said, I'll take it on. I will do this illegal thing if we pay the family back. Cause they had to pay like $10,000 to the charity to do the flight for them anyways. Oh, that's I was like, so I will do it if you give them their money and they, they can get their money back and it's free for them. And then we can go on about our business and make some good money and keep doing good stuff like this, right? Yep. Finally got paid. I walked in, I said, man, we got paid, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I'm excited, I'm gonna call the family. I talked to him all the time. And uh, he's like, he's like, uh, no. I was like, why? I'm like, we're giving them their money back, bro. He's like, no, they can call us. If they, if they wanted to stop calling them, if they really want their money, they can fight us and get it for it. Get us, get the money from us that way. I was like, you are literally scum below the scum right now. Like yeah. this family signed off all the paperwork. I did something illegal to help them out. And I bent my morals and values to do that. And I was like, I'm gonna quit unless you pay them. He's like, I'm not paying them, you're not quitting. 10 minutes later, I walked in, I said, I quit, I'm done. And uh, that was it. So I left on my own and I started air ambulance billing um, that day, basically and said, I'm gonna take what I know, what I learned and give it to our, our industry now. And I'm gonna be the first fixed wing biller that's gonna get these people paid. And I just, I just armed all your competition. I'm gonna go out and get them paid hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. to do it. And I said, in, in, my, in my mind too, I, I said, I'll never do that stuff again. And I will, if I'm gonna get in this industry and make that kind of money, I'm gonna have some rules. My first rule is if I can get it paid for by the insurance company, I'm never gonna charge a family member. If I get money back and they put down a deposit for the flight, I'm gonna give them back their money always. Um, and I'm never gonna take advantage of the system. It's always gonna be for the people. And if they're taken care of and they get the flight, then I'm okay making 300,000 a flight and reinvesting into programs like my uh, charity air ambulance. And the big one I do now is down in Belize, Triple R Rescue. And I'm gonna do something in this industry that's not normal. I'm gonna give back um, and I'm probably gonna do pretty well along the way. Yeah. And I thought if I make, <laughs> it's a lot of money, man. I, I used to think my highest dream was if I made 500,000 <laughs> a year, I could have a few employees, I could pay my bills and buy a house. And within five or six months of calling people and doing their medical bills and doing stuff for them, all these other uh, providers around the country, I think I did that in like three months. Yeah. yeah, you already had like the formula. It was crazy and I underestimated my ability so I wouldn't get ahead of myself mm -hmm. and then just blew it out of the water. It was, it, was in, it was insane. It was like the whole tide of the industry changed based on that ripple I put in it by not just helping out one guy, but helping out 20 other companies in the industry. And uh, 15 years later, it became one of the most lucrative companies, types of companies to buy and sell uh, like basically on Wall Street, big mm -hmm. money came in and we started buying these guys for like $100,000, like the old guy that I was working for. And upwards of two, $300 million were buying these companies that were almost bankrupt when I started billing for them. So you're just kind of getting in between insurance company and person, and you are doing that for air ambulances all over the country. Yep. That was kind of the- That was my thing. The main formula. Instead of going out and buying your own air ambulance. Correct. Your own- Correct. Investing Which all I that did money. Do. I did do that eventually, yeah. but yeah. The main mainstay, uh, mainstay was uh, helping out other uh, air ambulance companies, not reinventing the wheel. You do what you do and let me handle the mm -hmm. billing for 15%. That's insane. So I would make 15% of what I build. Yep. They were used to making 20, $30,000 a flight. They'd make a couple hundred thousand dollars a flight. They would get nervous, think I did something illegal. I had a whole thing I had to show them how it was not illegal so that the owners could read what they just got themselves into. And then it just turned the floodgates on. Yeah, I never I'm sure that's terrifying for an owner to, to realize like- They're like, okay, okay. And the way I sold myself as a, a billing company was I would go to these guys and say, hey, are you billing insurance? Like, hell no, insurance never pays. It's a waste of time. We just take, we just pay, we charge cash rate. So for a flight that I would charge $200,000 for, they would charge cash rate of $25,000, $30,000 cash, and they would charge your family. And your family would get credit cards together and pay them for this life changing, life saving flight that people needed, right? Yeah. And that was the industry standard because insurance was so bad. They beat us up so bad. They never paid anything and they were just 
monsters of our industry. They paid helicopter rates all day, exactly the same. 40, 50, $100,000 to fly across, you know, a city in a helicopter emergency, but not long distance stuff. They had a lot of loopholes that I learned how to close and they, they wouldn't pay. <laughs> let me, uh, let me You're turn good. that off. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to mess with you and have it like go off all day, all the whole entire podcast. <laughs> I think we're good on one. <laughs> 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 it was just going to go off constantly. Yeah. Well, uh, so if like, yeah, to me, if you're like, hey, who are you most scared of? I'd be like insurance companies. I feel like they do not play. They run the world, dude. They run the country, bro. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, they're, we, and they're all run by Satan himself. Me and Spencer kind of had this talk about it a little bit because, you know, Spencer's insurance salesman. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I almost had the trifecta on here. I've had insurance salesman, <laughs> dentist. I just need a lawyer. Right? <laughs> oh, that's what I turned my the company trifecta into. trifecta of yeah. uh, <laughs> I can get you some lawyers, man. <laughs> they're going to make their money, though, so if you're ready to pay for it, I'm on, though. They'll, they'll come on. Yeah, what, an hour and a half? Uh, <laughs> man, that'll be an expensive one. They'll view it as a commercial for themselves the whole time. <laughs> That's fine, huh? <laughs> but yeah, I would, I, 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 we were, it was so uh, raw, our industry. I never, we couldn't go to a lawyer for what we had. If I went to a lawyer, which I did a lot, I turned my company into a law firm. That's what I said, basically. I had a whole legal division and they weren't necessarily lawyers, which I did have a lawyer, a head lawyer on, on, on salary. But um, it was just the way you have to treat these things is like, a basically a, a, a case, every single flight was basically a legal case. If you didn't structure it that way, insurance was run like a legal case. Every single one of these claims in the high dollar department are after they get through the denials back and forth that they like pay somebody $50,000 a year to deal with. Mm -hmm. Once they get up into high level stuff where they need to pay and, I, and I'm pushing right, the right buttons, it goes to the legal division. And so now I'm dealing with lawyers. So I had to be a lawyer to fight and get paid. I mean, yeah. especially when they got wind of who I was and what I was doing, um, they really came at me pretty, pretty, pretty I was going to say, I'm sure you ruffled some feathers in oh. the insurance industry. Their it was goal bad. isn't to pay. And if you're getting money from them. Oh, I mean, if they heard this right now and I was still active in that world, they would, they would use this against me in some case that I was, I was in probably 20 different legal law cases ever at any given moment. I was in lawsuits that, just that often. people suing you constantly. Somebody come in insurance and serve you all the time. Just insurance companies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fighting them. And then the people that they, uh, that I was representing, basically the person that got flown and the air ambulance company I was billing for, um, I was basically their representative at that point. Cause it would get kind of big like that sometimes, especially on big long flights could be upwards of a million dollars. If it was like, you know, um, transcontinent, you know, across the pond. It oh, could wow. get crazy. Like if you're flying someone out of India and mm -hmm. then they got two, three stops flying an air ambulance back to America, you better have your stuff in a row because they're, they're, they're going to fight tooth and nail to p never pay that claim. Oh, I'm, I imagine. Is there yeah. like only a few insurance companies or is there There's like your main ones, hundreds? United, I mean, Blue Cross. A dozen? Yeah, you have, your, you have your main big guys that everybody knows. And then you have your mm -hmm. little small ones. And then you have the real small pain in the ass ones, real prickly little jerks. We only take handwritten forms yeah like, you can't type it up like weird weird stuff they'll come up with these weird rules um i usually try to fight legally to get them to take those rules off because it's just a whole bunch of loopholes and traps and roads to try to get you down so that they don't have to pay and their number one defense is time so if anybody out there has ever struggled with trying to get an insurance company to pay something of a procedure they were involved in or whatever uh one i'm I could help out. I know all the loopholes for that yeah. and how to get you off the hook and get them paid is, uh, it's time. They want to stretch you out and wear you out for years. And, uh, that's what they're designed to do. Yeah. You know? Medical billing is a crazy thing. In it's itself. a, it's, it's the most boring thing when you say I do medical billing, I do air ambulance mm -hmm. stuff. But when you get into it, 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 it was good for me because it was so, intricate and so many little things going on at any given time, my brain will get bored easy. I was super bored with mortgages because I figured it out and I was doing really well. And I yeah. you couldn't whip me to go in the office after a while. I hated talking about credit and getting approval on loans. It was so mundane and boring. But when I first started, it was fascinating. It was very, very, you know, complicated. But air ambulance stuff, it is insane. Like the amount of stuff that you got to know from, uh, the, the medical side to the transport side, the, the, the jet transfer and that whole industry 
to the insurance side, to the legal side, uh, to the just the money side, the legal system when you fight deep into court and what that whole world looks like. I mean, it's endless. And then new laws come out all the time that will make it better for us or harder for us, you know? Mm -hmm. So the, there's just a constant thing um, that I never really got bored with it. Um, now that I'm a lot slower now, I just do a few things, um, but it uh, it's very, very complicated. It was very, very good for me, you know, to keep me interested. Yeah. Did yeah. you feel like the U.S. government was at any point trying to kind of block you from the insurance companies? Because they lobby a lot of money to probably try to stop people like you. Yeah, they are owned by the insurance companies because, like I said, they run the world, yeah. right? So they have their bureaucrats and their people that go in, find the politicians that are weak. They pay for their, their, their stuff to get them elected, and now mm -hmm. you owe me. I, as an insurance company, let's say I'm Blue Cross, and I have John go fund you know, Peter's uh, election, and we get him elected because we give him $10 million, you know, and all that money is used for marketing. That guy gets elected. The insurance company now is the guy, is that guy. That guy is his puppet. So like Biden, I mean, I got a lot of problems with that. He's the puppet of China, in my opinion, right? So, yeah. uh, cause he's got a lot of money over there and they, they need certain things to happen. And uh, he's not a self-made money guy. He makes money through his work. Um, and like when people like Trump, they will say on the other side, he makes money through business transactions. And uh, like, for example, he, he was saying, they're like, well, what about an, an insurance companies and all the money they're gonna give you for your election when you was running? And he basically said, screw them. I don't need their money. They got enough money. And they got enough, they can spend on other things than these guys. I'm not taking their money. And that was really what locked in a different mindset for me with like somebody like that, where that Paul, he wasn't a politician. He didn't need their money. Yeah. He needed a different angle. And I think they're all crooked and dirty down to the core, all of them. Right. And they all have their weird quirks, but I could understand his mindset was like, I don't need to make my money from an insurance company funding my election. I can do mm -hmm. it on my own, a cleaner way of doing it. And, and I agree with that. And then he wasn't owned by them to tell him what to do when COVID hit Yep. and the laws and the stuff that he needs to stamp on to get them in to make sure that Pfeiffer and all these guys are the ones making our drugs, you know? So it's weird all how that works. Same. Cause, um, even locally I did some, you know, we recently were dealing with the racetrack situation. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. And after looking a little while, Taylor ranch owns the, owns that property mm -hmm. and top five, contributors to Ron DeSantis is Taylor Ranch. Interesting. I know. I'm like, ah, so yeah, he's not going to say a word. No, he's not. No, he's owned by that whole. But then I'm thinking everybody else on that board also knows that. Yep. Oh, do I want to run for governor someday? Right. Who's do I giving money? Who's giving money? Oh, that's who's going to fund the campaign. It's pretty dirty. And then man. I'm like, damn. So we're kind of screwed. Yeah. No, really. Once you realize like where the money's coming from, I had a direct line from our, um, one of our guys that got in the Senate, um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Well, he was on the board getting, getting silent shares, because that's what they'll do, these politicians. They'll, so they'll say, hey, uh, uh, I'll take your money, but the way you can get me my money is when I'm, while I'm in office and everything, I wanna be on your board so you can give me a $50,000 salary because they can do that mm -hmm. on your board of Blue Cross Blue Shield. And then I want, I want silent shares that are not on the books. I don't have to tell the people that I took $10 million in shares from you because it's not worth anything until I cash it out. So as soon as I'm done with my political run, I then am free and clear to now acknowledge those and start selling those shares for what I did five, 10 years prior. Yeah. And that's why someone who gets in is broke and makes $100,000 a year. And when they get out of politics later on, they're billionaires, you know, they're millionaires. Yep. So uh, that, when people are like, well, why would they get those jobs? They're only worth $100,000 a year. I'm like, it's for all the context and all the, all the crap that they get paid to do while they're there. They're, they're setting themselves up to be a monster in real estate or medical or whatever they want to get into afterwards mm -hmm. because uh, all those companies owe him or they have already given him shares. I've heard watches are a big one too. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, here's this. Oh, 
the have gifts. a million dollar watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Just because I like sure. you. Sure. Exactly. And it's a simple one. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And then um, the speaking, like, come speak to my oh, um, guest speaking. Yeah. Come on. Come Forget speak to this it. room of 50 people. Yeah. <laughs> we'll give you a million dollars. Exactly. Or oh, write a book. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a lot of things that they can do that are very tied to the money that they got to get elected. And there's a lot of stuff that they'll do with their celebrity, you mm-hmm. know. So, yeah, speaking and some other stuff. But, but like, always pay a dirty an tie. exorbitant amount for, like, a kind of just, like, an on-paper speaking role for, like, oh, you just spoke to my company of 50 people, and I paid you, a, mm-hmm. you know, a million dollars yep. for it. You know what the, 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 the you ever heard the joke, the, the difference between uh, a businessman and a criminal? What, the suit? Oh, <laughs> I, I pay taxes. <laughs> as long as you pay taxes... I am not messed with. Like my tax account and all that, I always said, if I wasn't audited, they'd go, sir, we owe you $50,000. You overpaid us. Yeah. Like you overpaid us in these categories. Uh, I actually did get a digital audit. The other day it was like automatic. I forgot to like file something. I don't remember. And they said, so we filed it for you. They rerun the numbers and uh, my account messed up on her numbers a little bit and they owed me $50. (laughs) I so they sent me this $50. whole thing. I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting audited, right? Yeah. It's like a little thing. And then you go through back page. It's like, so now we owe you $50. It's a credit for your next year. We'll take Get 50 bucks off your tank of gas for your Ranger. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I told Garrett, you're nothing in this world until you pay a million dollars in taxes a year. And I was there for a long time. And mm-hmm. that was how, you know, if you, if you've made it or not, I remember being around people that were fronting to be big money guys and stuff. And and girls would be like, oh, what do you think about him? And I go, don't ask him what he makes. Ask him what he paid in taxes. And if he tells you, oh, I just got a good accountant and I don't have to pay much, you know, I'm paying 30, 50, 100,000 a year or whatever, he ain't nothing. Cause you gotta be up in the million dollar range to be really up there. Cause you're paying 40 yeah. some percent, you know? Well, YouTube's For weird real. because when you're in like a mm-hmm. entertainment role, your whole life, so much of it is write off. Yeah. You buy that pair of pants and yeah. suddenly it's for, yeah. Entertainment video purposes. That's crazy. Because it all is. It is. It really, really, really Unfor- is. Like, it sounds yeah. crazy to say, yep. but, like, it is a weird thing. And, and you want to pay taxes true. because then if you want to get a loan on anything. You got to have the credit. show that I have taxes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I made the X amount, but I actually spent every single dollar. Yep. Yep. <laughs> There's no working room in my budget, so I can't get a $50 loan. Well, people would say, how does Trump not want to file his tax returns and show him? And he only paid X, Y, Z one year. I'm like, if you really understand it, because like my family comes from the Democrat side. My mom had a government job her whole life. My dad just worked for a college, did maintenance at a college. And they were always very Democrat because my mom was going to lose her job. If a Republican got in, they were going to cut the program head start and she was going to lose job. So they always cried whenever like, you know, Bush got in and other people, right. Never happened. They're still there today, but um, all her funding and all that stuff would, would, uh, would go away. And I was raised in that household. But then as I started to make money and see what the world is really about, um, now I'm not super one-sided. I think there's a yin and yang to everything. And you have to have Democrats to have a Republican. And that's the way it was designed. And that's how brilliant our forefathers were, was to create a, a system that cycles, right? I'm pretty much fully libertarian, so. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to I'm be. I'm pretty much just anti all government. <laughs> and you know what? I think hopefully that becomes a trend and really shuts this crap down because they're making us hate each other and fight each other. My family and I, we can't talk about politics. You know, and Mm -hmm. I'll get really, really mad because it affects my life directly with something that will happen. It doesn't affect their life. They're good to go. They made money during COVID. They made more money during COVID. Like all the grants. I didn't get none of that. If you make too much money, you don't get any of that kind of money. Yep. And uh, I'm like, you. if anything, Trump made you guys more money (laughs) than ever before from the government. And now Biden, you guys are paying more in gas and taxes and groceries. Probably all work from home now, too. (laughs) Oh, that's been a nightmare. Too. I made it easier for him. That, that's been a hard thing as an employer after all that. Um, and I just kind of went with the flow. I really got small after the uh, after COVID and I um, whittled it down to six, seven, eight employees now, I think. And uh, everybody works from home. I got rid of my office, killed that huge overhead. And it's not as efficient, yeah. I would say, but it's good enough. You know? Yeah, I and, would imagine with the money you saved. I seen a lot about how the work from home is going to ruin cities because all the office yeah. buildings are empty. Yeah, Amazon is killing on. it too. Like, Amazon's killing all the places. To, you don't want to go to a place. You just order it online now. Mm-hmm. 
I don't know when we're going to feel the effects of that, but it's it's happening now and it's happening by the millions and trillions of dollars going through Amazon and not a local store. Yeah. I mean, Walmart, you feel you don't feel bad for Walmart, but Walmart is the little the little retail shop in the small town that they ran out of business. Now, Amazon's going to run them straight out of business, mm -hmm. you know, because these big malls and all that big Walmarts. I mean, we still love to go. We need to. There's going to be, but it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and all that stuff. Just order it online. You can get it the same damn day and it's cheaper. I just steal everything from Walmart too. Oh, I'm a big thief. I just thief. grab it all and run out the door. <laughs> run? Act like you own it and just, just walk, walk out. out. Just leisurely, casually walk out. The old guy at the door isn't going to say anything. And if they, hey, if they tell me now I'm an employee of theirs and I got to ring myself up, I'm just not going to be that good of an employee. So if it doesn't beep when I scan it, not my problem. Yeah. I mean, the guy stopped me the other day. I was like, damn it. It's like, I just don't want to deal with this. I'm He's just like, you paid for a soda, Cooper. You didn't pay for any of this stuff. <laughs> and I'm a little tiny receipt and you got a big cart. I'm like, what do you do? Dock my pay? Yeah. <laughs> to well, self check out. I got a totaled cart I'm pushing around here. The thing's got two wheels. <laughs> the hair is clogged it. up the other one. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to try to do this. So uh, charity air stuff. I want to get into that. Oh, yeah. yeah that's a for sure. super interesting side yeah. of everything. I mean, cool. The fact that you've wanted to reinvest it into mm -hmm. helping in South America. Right. Anywhere. Anywhere. So how does that all work? Well, I got into it because my strategy, like I said, if I'm going to get in the industry, I'm going to help people out. They're number one. They're going to have a free flight with me. I'm not going to chase them for money. There are people out there though, you save their life, their family member, and they are indebted to you for life. After mm -hmm. you get off the phone call, you do the flight, and then they ghost you. They don't care to help you at all. Cause I need their help when I'm billing for those big bills. I need their help usually just tell the insurance bullshit a little bit. Hey, uh, uh, United Air Ambulance is coming after me hard. They did the flight and they're trying to charge me $300,000 because you guys won't pay it or whatever. I need them to play that game. Yeah. And, tell, and, and then insurance, it's a button for insurance. It's a trigger. Then they're supposed to, then they have to acknowledge it. And then we start negotiations and work out the payment, right? From the insurance company. Yep. So I have to like kind of fake bill the family. But a lot of times, man, these ghost you. They don't even want to help you no more. They don't, I mean, I would get everything from like an amazing video and letter from these families that were so grateful. I mean, I have boxes of that stuff, but then you come across people that just don't care at all. So when I say I've never billed somebody, that's not totally the truth. I have billed people to get my money back that I invested in their family. I don't know who they are. And then they just want to ghost me because they don't want to help me with their insurance. Or they want to say your bill is too high and they want to be on the insurance company's side now when they were the ones denying you the whole time. Who the heck wants to be on the insurance company's side? You'd be shocked how many people out there like, you shouldn't be getting that kind of money. Oh, you're going like, to take their side, the person that didn't want to help you? Yeah, and, and I, it's hard to have that conversation and say, hey, I'm not the bad guy. I'm a good guy. I reinvest my money. I created Charity Air, and that's what I do. It's hard for to have that conversation. But Charity Air was a, was a uh, concept and something that came out because I was already doing it. I already gave people free flights. I would invest in their flight, your family member, to be transferred and those hard costs of a flight's 20, 30, $50,000 sometimes. So I personally would invest that money, pay the provider to go do it. And then we retain the billing right to bill for the whole thing, right? So it's like a hospital, you get a bill from a hospital. The hospital didn't touch you, Cooper. Like yeah. they, the people inside did, right? So United Air Ambulance, which was my company, they didn't touch you. Um, AirVac Florida touched you, uh, but I paid them as a provider to touch you, but I handled the billing. So the bill is going to be 300,000 for my operation, but I only need to pay them three, 30,000, 40,000. It's like Uber. Yeah, exactly. And that's the way people, if they're still mad at me for billing that kind of money, making that kind of money, understand that every hospital is that way. Our healthcare system is the most elite on the planet. Don't listen to the bullshit like France has got to, dude, it is garbage. Everywhere else is garbage. They come here to get treated. They all fly here to get, I flew so many rich people from other countries to come here to get treated because mm -hmm. our stuff is by far superior. Especially like Canada where everybody oh, praises. It is a freaking communist they country They all come here it to get so treated. It is so bad, it is so bad. And they love it down here. But um, yeah, so don't, don't, don't be lulled into thinking that, that 
is I was a problem. I said, if I'm going to be in the industry, I'm going to give back. And so my system was set up that if you called me and the insurance was good enough, I would say, okay, Coop, I will cover the hard cost of this flight. I will fly your mom from point A to point B and we'll, we'll get her there, you know, whatever else. And you don't have to pay a dime. So then when the bill comes in though, please help my girls out, my crew out on getting paid. They may ask you to do a few things and then you would, you know, so you'd mm -hmm. sign the paperwork and we'd file it and appeal the denials because we're going to get denied and then um, go through. And then sometimes you would get paid the $300,000 check written into your name. Like you ever uh, got in a car accident and they just write you the check and you got to pay the, the, the shop to, yeah, fix, pay to fix it. Yep. They do the same thing with, huge checks. So they do that on purpose? Because the insurance company wants me to be in network, to make pennies on the dollar now, to sign a deal with them. So if they're like, if you're not in network and you don't want to be in the program of making nothing, um, here's your money, go get it. So now you have to hunt down this person that you just yep. helped yep. that may already be on the insurance company's side that now has a check in their hand for 100%, 100%. them for life-changing money. Yep. You know, and I have to, if I want to go after, they, they cash it all the time. This happened all the time. And that someone would hold me hostage and go, well, I have a lot of other bills. How about I keep like 50 of it? I would try not to lose my, fuck, my, my temper and I'd be like 25 grand, keep it. And just know that you just took out you your money, your selfishness just took a flight from John Doe who's gonna call me tomorrow. And that money was probably gonna pay for their flight. Yeah. So I was doing this charity style um, of a recipe already. So then I created Charity Air. And then I got into doing all the transports for uh, Supercross, Motocross with their with their charity. Um, it's how like I knew Travis from way back and helping um, um, sure another he's one been his hurt people. enough times where Dude, he's <laughs> had a lot of people hurt that I've transported. Well, Travis and, too, <laughs> and Travis. I never transported Travis, but I mean, we did a lot. Like, remember what's his name? Um, that that wrecked the razor and broke his back, and he still got some issues. All his videos are like him and his cats now. Well, um, yeah, I think I know who you're talking he about. He broke his back doing trying to do a long jump in razors, which by the way, guys never do long jump razor stuff. It is the most dangerous crap I've ever seen besides super cross. Nick Seuss. Yeah, exactly, dude. Like I've seen people's spines detach from their pelvis. I mean, it's, it's crazy bad, but, um, God, it's like goat or anyways, I can't remember his name. So I transported a lot of his people and he's, he's been a great guy though. He would always pay their bill for them. So he'd pay me the cash to do it. And then I would try to call him and say, hey, I owe you money back or whatever. And he's like, just do it for another charity deal. So he's always been really gracious with that. Oh, wow. That's really crazy connection to yeah, weird, kind of right? come full circle, basically. Yeah, random. That. And then I did you see the video a couple years ago when the, the girl broke her ankle at Garrett's house? At Gleach's house? <laughs> oh, yeah. I saw that one. <laughs> I was so 10 weeks. I was so drunk that night. We you were, were on all, the scene. Well, like, hey, get Uncle Chet. Isn't he a medic? I'm like, oh, my You God. nearly just drowned. <laughs> Wasn't that the same situation? No, that was the year prior. Okay, that was the year prior where you- or two years prior, nearly yeah. Nearly drowned. <laughs> <laughs> and then the girl broke her ankle on, like, something, yeah. something stupid. Yeah. I don't I'm remember. shocked. I'm shocked Garrett's parents still like me. <laughs> 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 I'm always in the middle of some crazy, stupid thing. My whole life as a kid, my parents would always be like, you don't have to be a center of attention. I'm it was like, good you were there. Oh, no, it helped. I mean, you were the I, only I, one I that had any ankle. experience. Oh, I was the only one to keep everybody calm, you mm -hmm. know? Um, I would have tried it. <laughs> yeah, right. Bronte always gets <laughs> mad at me because I tell her, she's like, I'm like, if anybody's, you know, we're on an airplane and somebody says, is there a doctor? <laughs> and nobody stands up. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm going to raise my hand. <laughs> you know, if nobody steps up. Right. At, at some point, you got to be like, I'm not queasy around blood. I'll, yeah. I'll go for it. You know, How are like, you, have, have you done any medical training? No, and I've <laughs> wanted to forever, but I've been around enough hurt people where I've gained a little bit. And I've done a lot of like, um, you know what I should do? I've done Boy Scout stuff. So oh, okay. You, you, you would understand. I've done like the basic. Yeah. And I understand like trauma and like cutting out wounds, like, you know. Yeah wounds and stuff. If it I've doesn't bug you, then enough. yeah, you would be good for it. You'd probably be a great medic. I wouldn't yeah. throw up in blood situation yeah, and yeah. I calm down in high stress situations. Honestly, your like, tone would probably be very good on a medical scene. It's that's, pretty, pretty calming actually. That's what my mom always says whenever she has like a anxiety, she always calls me. 
Because even when I get in my car, like, I'm more calm pulling up to the line than I am putting my gloves on. Yeah. Okay, like, okay. I, I calm kinda that down way too. Yeah. into that Inside, spot. though, are you kind of a little bit jittery? Not really. I, That's I, good. It brings me down. That's good. That's good. You're, like, so. yawning. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I need to do, I should do a first aid class with our whole group. I should just do a quick, have everybody in a roundabout, show them CPR, mm-hmm. tell them the basics of ABCs, of what to deal with first, don't panic, you know. Someone's got to call 911, you know, just chill out because we are doing pretty dangerous stuff. Yeah. I mean, if we're rolling, if we're rolling monster trucks and breaking ankles, exposed, broken ankles in the back of Garrett's house. I mean, yeah. people can imagine all the stuff we do off. That was an exposed <laughs> bone. <laughs> Open fracture. Yes. Yeah. Oh, man, that was bad. And her dad was like, you're going to set it. He was a doctor. I was like. Okay. <laughs> I never would ever do that in the field. It's so not good to do. <laughs> so I had to actually set my knee. Oh, um, it popped out. I was walking in my yard and my dog full speed hit it, popped, bent my leg like Side, sideways. Sideways on the end, yeah. Yeah, and I kind of reset it on my own, just like yeah. pushed it right back yeah. into place. <laughs> and thankfully that seemed like the right thing to do. The Dumb time. dog. Yeah, you know, it's like, man, you're lucky you're cute. <laughs> well, it's either, yeah, it's either that or you're going to fall in, in, <laughs> in the hole underneath the car. Yeah, or that <laughs> freaking Bowser's hole. Dude, that hole, guys, it's literally like... <laughs> That deep yeah, there's end. like a six foot wide what, hole. Is under that a 240Z car. parked on top of it? Yeah, it's literally gonna fall in the hole. I know it's not that heavy of a car either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are tin can of a car. Yeah, so but yeah, so the charity thing, I just created the charity air thing, and then I just started doing the same recipe. But it was great for marketing because now I can market and say, hey, I'm a charity. And now, now one thing that people that I know, I couldn't do a free flight for anybody that called me. That was the only downside. Like I tried to do one a month, which was, I knew there was no insurance. It was like a pro bono flight is what we called it in the office. Yeah. And they'd be like, Hey, we got a bono, a bono, um, applicant, you know? And that meant like, they don't have insurance at all. They're never, we're never going to get recouped on this. You're just going to pay $50,000 to do it. And I, I, I hit over a million dollars in free charitable flights um, pretty much every year I did it. Oh, wow. You know, that was where I knew I wouldn't get it back. On top of multiple millions of dollars that I never got paid it back at all by an insurance company. So you got to understand, if I build that much money, um, it's, a, it's a law of averages. I definitely would not get that kind of money back, or we would have to negotiate a low pay mm-hmm. and try to get them a little bit higher. Um, and if we got paid in full which we did better than everybody in the country, I think, um, then we would take it. But a lot of times we had to like kind of take less. The way the, the way the insurance companies work too, just so people want to know, I could be a roofer and I could charge you a million dollars to do your roof, but I'm never going to get business, right? In America, you're free to do charge what you want, yep. but nobody's ever going to do it. Um, but an insurance company, I mean, like a air ambulance provider, if you're in an emergency situation, you could also charge a million dollars. Um, and you have insurance that has to pay it. But the way the emergency network is in America is they regulate that. They, they only will pay a certain amount and you have to take it. If you're going to get the emergency license in America, um, you can't, you can bill what you want, but you can only take the insurance companies only pay you a certain amount. And then that's really what you're allowed to take. So my industry was different where I could bill someone a uh, million dollars or whatever, but as long as they went with me, insurance companies technically have to pay me that million dollars. They have to pay me. If they do, that's another so argument. it's like a legal bill. Like, point, yeah, right? like they legally have to. I provide a medical care mm-hmm. and they're going to come back at me and say, well, Medicare rates are terrible, by the way. They're like a nothing. So we're going to pay you a thousand dollars, you know, or whatever the deal is terrible. Um, and then I'd have to legally tell them, no, you can't force that rate on me. I'm an out of network biller. My mm-hmm. bill is a million dollars. You have to pay me, you know, but a lot of times there was a meet in the middle, meet below middle type of a deal. And then I made, I made a lot of money and I did it for, you know, 10, 15 years. So when people see me, um, you know, with the cars and having fun and all that one, I own everything, everything I own free out. And two, uh, I probably gave away 10 times that amount in uh, free flights and doing good things with the money, mm-hmm. um, which I still continually do. And that's why I can sleep at night and nobody can ever come at me and get to me. If they say you're a bad person causing the medical uh, problems in America and the overbilling and all that stuff, 
I sleep well at night because I know what I did with that money. And, yeah, you and I did reinvested to helping people. Yeah, and, exactly. So, quick tangent. Is it worth getting travel insurance then? No. Is that what, like, you know, you get an American Express travel it's, insurance it's or when you get it from, like, because that's an interesting, that would. Right. To me, I'm thinking, like, my brother right now, is he's in Peru. Mm -hmm. And my sister just came back yesterday from Guatemala. Wow. So they were both okay out of the country, South America, overseas. And I'm thinking, like. Well, I'm a good person to know. Yeah. Just call me. We're, I'll it take helps. care of it. Yeah. Everybody out there, I'm still a pretty good person for that. But um, do they have normal health insurance? I believe they both do, yes. If they have normal health insurance, they're fully covered. They're fully covered just like travel insurance. Really? Travel insurance is a supplemental. So travel insurance will be in the first position. So if I got travel insurance, I would bill them the 300000 <laughs> They'd pay me 5000 because they have a limit. They yeah. can legally give a limit of what they're going to pay. That's the other thing. In America, um, insurance companies, there's no laws that limit. When Obama came in, he took off lifetime limits. That was another bad story about my old boss. He would run the bills up on these people and like, hey, my son needs, he's got cancer. He's going to die and we need to have all these medical treatments covered by insurance. He only has a million dollars in lifetime coverage and your air ambulance bills $500,000 of it. Um, and they're going to pay you. Um, mm -hmm. Can you not bill that much so that I have more money for other procedures for my son? And that guy repeatedly said, no, I'm going to take my money. Yeah. And he's, he masqueraded himself online as an angel. So if it's like a pie chart, he's just taking his All big it. chunk. He's like, I'm going to take my money. Yeah. He had a very crass and terrible attitude about it. But yeah, so that's the bad people in our industry that would do that. If I heard that and that was real and I knew it was real, I would 100% say, okay, I still got to bill what I'm going to bill, but I'm going to make a massive donation back to you and your family. So start a GoFundMe and I'm going to give you a ton of it. Yeah. Back. You know, because I agree it's not okay. And I would turn that into, I did that a lot for Supercross guys. I say, start a GoFundMe. I will promote it. I will publicize it. I will pay advertising to show people that it's out there. And uh, I will donate 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever kind of money I would donate to it to get it jump started. And then um, hopefully we'll gain some momentum and some people were popular enough and their story was good enough. It, hmm. Hundreds of thousands of dollars for their medical treatment later after the air ambulance. So I parlayed what I did into something bigger. Mm -hmm. So I did that a lot. So that was Air Ambulance uh, and Charity Air in North America, and I only helped Americans. I would only help Americans, Canadians, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, we do not open for other countries. We only help Americans. Yeah, U.S. citizens only. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, or expatriates, I didn't help them either. If you want to go to another country and be an expat, go for it. You're not American mm -hmm. anymore. You still speak English, you still look American, but you are in another government's program. So yeah, that we're makes not, sense. That's a, you. that's a tough one. That's a, has that come up? Oh, a lot, like a it. lot. So I was, I'd say I wanted to retire at 40. I was on a- uh, People uh, like Pat McAfee go out of the country. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you know anything about him. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about that right now. <laughs> so I happened to be in Belize. This is exactly where Pat McAfee was. Yes. Well, is it Pat? Yeah. I heard. It's just McAfee. Let's just say, yeah. I don't know. That might be his name. Yeah. Anyway, so McAfee was down there too. I didn't know this. I go down there on a bachelor party, which was like being on a catamaran with a bunch of guys. And we just not bachelor party. -ish, we were fishing and scuba diving. John McAfee, I think. Yeah, John. That's right. And so we were hanging around Belize and uh, just enjoying the, the place. And I was kind of burned out. I was actually kind of done with it. I wanted to go home. Like, oh, no, we're going to go to we're going to go to San Jose. We're going to go to a whole other place and uh, <laughs> be here another five days. I was like, oh, great. You know, it's very rural. <laughs> it's a it's, long trip. It's very rural. It's like the rural places of Costa Rica, which I was very involved with, too. I did a lot of international stuff, too. And so I, we were at a bar, and my buddy that worked for me was like, this is a firefighter bar. I was like, oh, that's cool. Let's go find the guy who runs the place. And we found him. He was uh, he was up here in Florida and then he retired from Tallahassee or something and he started a bar down there. Mm -hmm. So we were having a great time to drink in and he's telling us all this stuff. He goes, you know what I'm doing now though is there's a charity here called Triple R Rescue where a girl went out in the bay with a guy, a guy on a jet ski. They wrecked. Uh, she didn't have a uh, life jacket on. She ended up drowning and dying and the whole story touched me. It was pretty terrible. Like in America, we're so used to it. We would have been saved. We probably would have been saved. At least they would have found our body within a short period of time yep. and the family could be put at ease. It was like three or four days. They finally got a helicopter like out of Guatemala. As soon as they got up in the air, 
they saw her, they found her dead in this big, huge estuary and uh, could put the family at, at rest with what had happened. And it was just a terrible story of their healthcare system and their lack of um, resources and us as dumbass Americans go everywhere. Mm-hmm. And some guy, we get off a taxi and goes, hey, let me take you out, you know, uh, jet skiing. or Cliff diving in the middle so, of nowhere. People, that is so dangerous. The only way I recommend doing it, because I love that fun, because uh, I believe I am an OG fun haver. We can talk about that later. Uh, uh, is that um, go with the ones with the resort has insurance because they'll have insurance and ask them, do you have insurance? Can I see your document? If you really, you should, because if you get hurt on their little expedition, you are on your own and you're yeah. in a foreign country and you are 100% liable for all of it. Especially if you're like far, far too. Yeah, yeah. Belize is very rural. Yeah. I mean, there's not much going on there. Because, like, we were, you know, on our honeymoon, we were down, what is it? Yeah, uh, where'd you go? It was, like, Dominican, whatever the okay. island right next to it is. One of those. Okay. It was not far, where it's, yeah. like, you can yeah. almost see Florida. You're so <laughs> yeah, close. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So that's, like, you kind of feel a little safer knowing that you're that close. Like, cruise ships stop there and if stuff. it's not America, bro. It's not America. You're not, you're not safe. <laughs> but, yeah, so... You were down in Yeah, so I had done a ton. I had run the whole EMS system in, I won't get into this, but in Costa Rica, Peru, uh, Cancun, Cabo. Uh, If you got hurt or anything happened, I literally was the guy that had the network of people to get a plane to you and fly you out. And usually an American plane too, because they are under different regulations. So I get an American jet to fly in, fly you out. And I love those flights because insurance can't deny that they're, they can't say, well, you can go to Germany if you're from, if you're in Spain, you can go to Germany, they have a good healthcare system there. It's like, eh, there's nothing down South, only yeah. America. So they have a hard time denying it on medical necessity. Um, they could only deny it if uh, they say they don't want to pay you that much and they'd fight you on that to- topic. Or if um, they just say that he didn't need to go at all, then they would try to fight you. But we were pretty good at what we did and we knew if they had insurance and we flew them, we were going to get paid in some capacity. So I was doing that all in Latin America and was doing very, very well. And for one reason or the other, I won't get into it. I decided that I just didn't want to be a part of it anymore. It was mainly the group and the, and the politics and the people I was working with, um, let's just say weren't very far off the cartel. I mean, that's what it turned into. It was yeah. kind of fairly dangerous down there. Highly dangerous. I would only travel with a bodyguard. It was it was a whole other life for me that people don't realize. That's mm-hmm. what I did for a long time. So um, I was in Belize vacation, and they tell me the story. And my partner that I worked with, he's like, "We got to come down here. Nobody's nobody's running EMS down here. Nobody's helping them." And I'm like, "I don't want to deal with it, man. It's such a." It's so hard. They don't know anything. They don't even have ambulances on this major island. They have golf carts. People get thrown on a golf cart and taken to a terrible clinic, which is underfunded, like third world country. Um, If any of them see this, I love you guys, but they know that they're super underfunded. Yeah. Awesome people, well-educated, terrible resources. And I'm like, the way I could describe it to the people is I was in deep jungle in, let's say, you know, (laughs) Uh, by in Latin South America and we're on a trip and someone goes, there's gold in here. We are deep in the jungle. And they're like, there is a gold mine here. Right. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably been found before, but it's impossible to get the gold out. You have to build roads, build a whole city to mine this area that would take millions and millions of dollars. And at the end of the day, the government and the competitor could come in and take it from you in a foreign country. That's just the way it works. Right. That's why nobody's dumped the Belize. It's not a big market for air ambulance, really. It's a small travel country. It's not big compared to Mexico at all. It's a fraction, Yep. right? But and I would imagine it's starting to grow now because nobody wants to go to Mexico. True, true. It, and, and it was. And so... My brother's a surfer, so he... Oh, he loves to travel around. Oh, yeah. He's uh, been everywhere Costa in the Rica's country. amazing, the, too. He's been all over the world surfing. Yeah. Belize kind of sucks because there's a, a reef around the whole major island there. There's like mm-hmm. an island of San, uh, San Jose. So anyways, um, or San Pedro. I Costa Rica has the same type of names. <laughs> anyways, so um, he's just like, come on, let's go have dinner with the with the certain people we go well the freaking mayor come the governor or mayor whatever of the island come and they're they're very similar to they were british 
uh, yep. rule for a long time. And so their whole government's set up with a democracy. It's like the red and the blue. <laughs> and now the red, the blue team is in and they, the red team was in parliament for a long time. Now the blue team took over after yeah, 15 parliament, years. all that. It's, it's similar, but not the same. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, we meet with him and he's just like, man, we, we really need help. Like we got nothing. We have nothing. And I was like, well, maybe I can, I'll donate some ambos. I'll get you guys some stuff from medical stuff. We have this company that'll bring million dollars worth of gear down for 20 grand. I'm like, we'll, 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 we'll help you out there. And they're just like, man, we need you. Like we need somebody that is experienced. And my buddies in my ear is like, we're the only people on the planet that could come in and develop this country. Nobody else can do it. And if, the Mexicans want to come in and do it. You know what they're going to do, which is basically dog eat dog. And they're just going to make their money and not care about Belize. They're yeah. going to just make their money, use it as a money maker, get run out of the country when the Belize gets sick of it. And they're going to be left with nothing again over and over and over. That's kind of what they've dealt with. And they were really needing help. And I was like, damn it. So within a month, we went back down. We bought a little, uh, a little van. We built an ambulance uh, in the streets of Belize <laughs> and uh, basically called in an ambulance. Where are the YouTube videos on this? Yeah, I have a lot of stuff that's in the can. Yeah. <laughs> and so I uh, did all this stuff and uh, hired 10 people now. And we are the number one and only air ambulance provider of the whole country. And we do all of the EMS. And uh, I actually have three ambulances right now. One we gave to Garrett. You were in the picture. Yep. Uh, that one, Garrett didn't need it. So I got them fixed up again. And I'm going to send them both with a Japanese one I just got down there. And that will be number like eight or nine, I think, ambos I've donated. And basically, we've developed that country now. So on that island, there had never been an ambulance in existence on that island. It worked 20, 20, you know, like it's crazy. Yeah. And now that we've had one down there for four years, four or five years What kind of like now. rough population is on an island like So that? an island can swell from anywhere from 20,000 to 80,000 in the popular high yep. time. So a big EMS uh, nightmare if, you know, stuff hits the fan. Like yeah. you are, you are on your own. So now, um, and the, the president, we know him and everything, like they love us because, you know, what we do is basically it's how it works. The government, the, the, the people of Belize get transported for free by our company. Every ambulance, every air ambulance is free. If they need it, we pay for it, we handle it. And any American or tourist would do all tourists too if they have insurance, we just bill them. And if we make enough money from them, which we do, it funds the entire country of Belize's EMS needs, especially for that island of yeah. San Pedro. So you've single-handedly made Belize safe for a American lot tourists. I will agree, yeah, like 100%. Actually, like, with your own hands made it. Yep. The ambulance where, you could get picked up in is something that I basically help build, put yeah. the stickers on. <laughs> so you would say if, if somebody's like, I want to travel to South America. Mm-hmm. Go to the Belize. Go to Belize. <laughs> you can now. Go it's, there. That's probably your dangerous. best bet. Uh huh. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. probably one of your best bets for <laughs> safety wise. That's when I crazy. did Mexico and all those places, I, I ran the whole country of Costa Rica for a long time. Had the main hell. We had four or five helicopters. We were we were cranking, and uh, had a doctor network of like fifteen doctors. It was, it was really really good, man. And these guys messed it up, but um, it was so like big. The that, locals messed it up, or like no no um, the. The team you then the, 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 put the, into the, place. The, the spawn of my team came in and cancered it, trying to take it away from me and just caused the cancer and it just destroyed it. That's basically. unfortunate. And, and it happens every day in those countries. I mean, it's just the way it kind of works, you know? Yeah. And it's why they kind of are perpetually in need. They just, people don't realize how special America is. Like, we think the system's broken now and we're having our trouble our times now are not good. And they're like, oh, this country's better and we should have this type of health care. It's like, bro, everywhere else is garbage. You don't get it. And it's a terrible cycle. If it does well for a couple of years, it will fail eventually because yep. the bad people make money or they turn into becoming bad people. And that's all they care about. And uh, I can't blame them. I mean, they're raised dirt poor and then they start making good money and they just want to take, 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 you know? Well, it's and crazy because, like, so much of South America, Venezuela, Cuba, mm -hmm. like, so much Guatemala. has just been destroyed by 
yeah. cartels and by oh. communist regimes and it's crazy, hyperinflation man. in Venezuela. Is just money like, rules the world down there, and money rules the world in America, but it's completely different. And when I say I respect our forefathers for creating what they did, they did something very, very special. And like the Roman Empire, I think we will fail at some point. I mean, in our future, hopefully it's later than sooner. Yeah. But um, it was amazing recipe for success. I'm a, I'm a God-fearing man. I think God has a huge... Religion has a huge portion of it to keep us in the morals and values of, of doing it the right way. But then our business sense to set up a, de a, a democracy in the right, right way that fights and argues with each other is healthy. And uh, we had something that was very special in the history of mankind. And I think we need to preserve it and keep doing what we're doing and, and realize that uh, we have something pretty special because these other countries don't. And if you did any, spent any time in these other countries, you would realize how special America is. I think everybody needs to go over there and see it. Yeah, I think if you look at our constitution, you realize how well written it's it incredible. really is. And how it it's held incredible. up so well yep. in yep. 200 years. Yep. And that they, the wording was so, was so I know. broad, but so not that uh -huh. things can't be reinterpreted like crazy. But yet they just hold up where they can't be abused as I well. I know. They knew what they were doing. People it's forget. Really man. weird. Yeah, they came from a what parliament rule of like of 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 one of leader. Great Britain, yep. you know, and that system was broken mm -hmm. and it wasn't working. And these people revolted. That's how bad it was. People don't realize how bad the red coats were to revolt and have the Tea Party and do what we did in our history, right? And uh, yeah, we have our terrible slavery and all the crap that's built these countries and built these societies. But like overall, that was so bad that we created something new that they learned the lessons of our forefathers and then created some documents and some, the way of the run uh, country that it's not biblical, but it's pretty biblical on how well it was set up for the future. And it's, and the, the writings and the stuff that they put in are still holding strong mm -hmm. today. If you just follow those rules, yeah, you know, not blanket following them, though things do need to change. But if you follow these basic rules, man, like America could keep going on indefinitely. But like, it's crazy. There's no racism in there. There's no sexism right. in right. there. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like for yeah. anybody else. Right. It's only for the people. Yeah, the people, the human beings Everyone. That, are, that are yeah, here. Yeah, like, yeah. People always say it's a racist document. There's nothing racist in right. there. Right. No, and I and I and that's Until you can it was turn modified. anything into it. You, exactly. <laughs> you could turn any document into becoming a a racial document. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Bible could be looked at that way, and uh, you know the the homosexual movement, all that stuff. You can really amplify certain things in the Bible, and I'm I'm a strong Christian in that sense. Quietly, in that sense, that if I do what I need to do and better my life every day according to a certain set of rules and the way I want to live my life. Mm -hmm. That's all that I think Jesus and really he wants you to do. And the judgment of people is like the biggest downfall of man is like in our nature to be sinners and judge people, yeah. but it has nothing to do. My life has nothing to do with you and you don't affect my life. And if your life does affect me in a certain way, then we need to work it out. But if it doesn't, man, just Lay off, and and it's unfortunate, you know. A lot of the movies and and the world now can like really make, uh, you know, Christianity, for example, the bad guy in every movie, mm -hmm. you know. And they do take the bad guys in our community and amplify them, but that's not that's not what our core is about. What the core is about is about loving and taking care and forgiving your neighbor. I mean, that's all it is. Yeah, I mean, if you read the Ten Commandments. You really can't disagree with them. They're very no. If you follow those rules, rules, you're gonna be you have a pretty good life. And then also read the seven <laughs> deadly sins, and you're like, oh yeah, I shouldn't be yeah. doing any of that stuff. I agree. It's yeah, very simple. You don't have to. You don't have to believe in anything else. But if you read those two, and you're like, you it's have a undeniable. disagreement, you're kind of it's undeniable. A bit of a sociopath. Everything else is very selfish, and it'll get you to a dead end. And you're mm -hmm. gonna have to make a decision. And the decision, if you want to keep doing that, is hurt and maim other people around you and take advantage of them. And to me, Christianity, if, if done the way it's supposed to be, it only builds your neighbor and it's just, it's all built around love and kindness and forgiveness. Yeah. And you can't do that without it. So I think that's what a lot of our, 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 the way the country was set up. And it's just unfortunate that's been, you know, twisted into something that it's not. And, uh, and the powers that be and the voices that are out there right now are making us fight. Are, it, 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 they wanted the libertarian vote, 
You know, they wanted those millions of guys in the middle because those were all free votes that weren't voting for the, you know, Democrat or Republican side. So they devised a program through the Internet to basically make us hate each other. And you have to pick now you Mm have you are hated as a liberal. Because how dare you not defend me on my side? How dare you not defend me on my side? And the majority of those people in the middle had to make a choice. They got off the middle and now they've made a choice. And it's it's created like a tension, like I said, in my family. Like it, my dad is the nicest guy on the planet. He doesn't talk bad about people behind their back. My whole life, I had an amazing mentor. And if I bring up Trump, he turns red. He gets mad. It's crazy how that I'm works. Like, Dude, this some CNN people. is cancering your brain, yeah. Dad. Like, you are not mad about anybody, let alone somebody you don't even interact with. You don't even know the guy. You don't know him personally at all. There's so you much hate him. alternative good news that you shouldn't watch Fox or CNN. Oh, it's garbage. It's all find garbage. somebody that you like on YouTube that <laughs> isn't paid by yeah. someone or on yeah. Rumble or on yeah. something else that isn't yeah. paid by someone and listen to like 10 different people. I agree. Or just Way don't better. at all. I don't listen to the news at all. My parents have to tell me, oh, there's another shooting. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, ignorance is bliss in a lot of ways and maybe I should pay more of attention. Um, but I, I just don't, I don't want to get into it because I don't, I don't know if it's true or not either. Yep. I don't know what to believe and not to believe. So I'd rather just <laughs> deal with things in my own perimeter in my life and, uh, that, that's how I choose to run it. You so know? I have an interesting one because you have so much knowledge on dealing with these big corporations. By the way, you're doing a great job, stuff. Cooper. Oh, thank you. This is a really cool podcast. You've done a, I've watched the other ones and you've done a really great job. I think you found something. The only thing I would tell you that don't be afraid to do one-on-one podcasts by yourself. I've often thought about that. So if you got some stuff you want to talk about, people, mm-hmm. people like to listen, you know, and Sometimes if you got a good my opinion. Wife there and just kind of like. Hey, man, it could be about anything. I take half of it and she'll just <laughs> for a little input. Yeah, yeah. Dude, but thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. no, I think that, and it'll give you more time if you're sitting around. I, I do that. I just don't have the drive to do it as much, mm-hmm. you know, for my stuff. I mean, you see, I have a setup, but I just, yeah, I'll do it when I want. But I think if you got some stuff that got you hot and heated or whatever, just start talking, man. Yeah. I think people will really like it. So, Well, funny enough, our next thing I wanted to talk about was the EPA. Okay. (laughs) And I know, I mean, because like I said, you kind of fight in this world of like insurance and government and like all the same crap, bureaucratic Mm -hmm. levels and like, Uh where do we go from here? What do you see with the EPA? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you're with JH, you were with him today. He's, he's one of the guys that got hit. He's got hit really hard. Brent just sent me a a prelude. He helped me tune. I have a VTech prelude I was going to bring on the channel. um, And he just helped me tune it, just got it back. And uh, I mean, standing up for my friends is one of my things that I will always do. And and him and JH, it's like the EPA, man, is just a bunch of people that need to keep their job. That's what I think. They need to justify their job and being involved in, I love you, mom. But like, I don't know how many times as a kid, she say, she ran a Head Start and it's a great program. And uh, it's great for kids and under underfunded program where they can take on babies and healthcare yeah. and help families stay together. That's the whole thing, you know, and uh, let us watch your kids while you go work. That's what Head Start is. And it's, it's a fantastic program, but she would always come back and talk to my dad and go, I got to spend the money. I'm not going to get it next year. I got to spend the money or these people are going to get fired. If we don't have to justify these jobs right now, I'm going to lose half my girls whenever, you know, Bush gets in or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. And in that, I agree with her. I understand that. But then on the other side, the big picture is you can see these people at the EPA. I mean, I wonder how many jobs are being justified right now. So when people are like, oh, the president doesn't matter, it matters a lot, especially with government jobs. So I'm sure there's more people working at the EPA than ever. I don't know. I'm just assuming. And they're getting paid more than ever. And they are have all the leeway in the world to, to exercise their laws and their rights to, to prosecute and do what they're doing. And that's exactly what they're doing to let their party know uh, we are needed and we need to be funded, well-funded. And it's a unique situation when you have people that work for the government and their livelihood is based on it, their job is based on it. And they are going to start doing radical things like attack uh, a polluting farmers, um, <laughs> of, yeah, a, a polluting uh, mass of race car drivers that uh, uh, probably calculates to 0.001% of all the pollution on the planet. And they're going to attack us. Like, yeah. get out of here. Are you... Are you ju- it's not surprising to me that they've attacked us, but 
if we don't do something about it and we don't have somebody that will commit their life to it, we're gonna lose. We're gonna lose racetracks. We're gonna lose our cars. We're gonna lose the ability to tune and have a good time. The electric world is here. Um, and that's, they don't give a shit about what we do in our sport and our fun. And um, I think it's so healthy. It's such an American thing to have is the freedom to tune our cars and have fun on the weekends yep. and go race at a track legally, you know, and do all these things. Um, and for them to attack us and attack somebody like JH and Brent, it's so ridiculous to me um, that they would attack guys like that. I mean, we're talking about like 100,000 people, 200,000 people. Yeah. Dude, it's like the smallest group who that you're cares? just like putting energy into. It's crazy. It's because we, um, you know. It's, Are we easy picking? Yeah. I think that's part of it. I we're, think they were on the internet too and they could see them on channels and go, let's go after them. We're easy picking. Same like, as Dave Sparks. Yeah. Exactly what happened to him. He got big. And oh, we got a lot of black smoke. Oh, yeah. TV show. That was the most crooked thing I've money. ever seen, dude. Behind the scenes, man. What you talked about when I talked with him about that stuff. Yeah, because you've had a car built by then. Yeah, and it was happening right then. I had a car, a truck inspected by uh, whoever that group was, came to my house, crawled under it, and did a, I had to let them ha come in and do a full inspection of my truck. They wow. Said. Yeah, it was a Duramax. Yeah, yeah, so I, f I forgot you were involved, basically, in yeah. their... Right in the middle of it. Yeah, right, mm -hmm. as everything was kind of coming down on them. You were on the TV show and everything. Yeah, it was a it was a crazy hustle at the time, man. He told me a little bit about it, and it was such a crooked thing, man. Like, they literally saw him as an easy target. This blowing, rolling coal is a new trend, yep. and we are going to make some money. And it was this law group that basically came to him and said, pay us 500 grand and we won't take this to court. They literally blackmailed them with money and it's all in the name of their environmental So this was like a behind. third party law group. 100%. That just came to him, kind of like the ambulance chasers slip and fall, like. Yep, and said, pay us the money and we will go wow. away. Wow. Pay us our group, pay our, pay our legal group the money and we will go away. And he said, oh, there's no way, get out of here. They go, okay, well, we're going to go to the EPA and we're going to arm ourselves with the EPA mm -hmm. and they're going to back everything that we're going to do and we're going to crush you. And then millions of dollars later and how he had to change all his videos and he yep. can't film certain things now, he lost a monumental case against us and our world because it showed those people that they can win. And they were a private, to my understanding, it was almost like they were getting paid as lawyers for this environmental group, which is money. Like they literally made money on it. Just government funded money. Exactly. From just fighting exactly. people. Yeah, I mean, that's where it's tough. Cause like, yeah, there's probably, there might not be somebody in the EPA watching my videos, mm -hmm. but there may be somebody in a law firm mm -hmm. looking for a case and building uh, a case. Easy, easy pickings. Because once the government starts handing out checks yeah. to companies that bring someone in. Yeah, and the, and the government, writes the check to the law firm because the, 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 yeah. the law firm goes to the government and says, hey, we found a case here. What do you guys think? And they go, oh, okay. Well, you guys are going to get paid as our legal team now. Mm -hmm. and, and then let's go get them. And then they were the legal team with the EPA to go attack. Contract to attack him. To shake down and they were getting paid, Dave they're for getting everything. Paid for every did. hour on the hour, getting paid millions of dollars to do that. Um, they basically, yeah, they take advantage of the system. And, you know, our, our good friend Garrett, Man, I, I, I'm so protective of him because he's the biggest beacon out of the group. And he is such a fun loving good guy in, you know, in reality, like how much he likes to enjoy himself and make these fun videos and, and uh, yeah, he should wear a helmet more often or whatever, right? Like all the ex accidents that we were all yep. in without him. And, uh, you know, he'll change his ways, but like, it just takes one, one really bad incident. And man, I just dread the day that he's gonna get hammered with something um, that might stick. Like we, he has these events and you know, the kid got burned and we talked a lot about that. He was really scared. Today, actually, Parker, huh? who got burned. I saw the person who got burned oh. today. Yeah. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and thank God it was not him, but like his family and everybody was like, mm -hmm. I took my own risk. I, I built a, a car that could do that. Could have been somebody in the crowd. Yeah, and it could have been someone in the crowd. It could have been, because look, let's just be honest. If he did that and he was a jerk and his family wanted money, let's say yeah. he was unconscious and the family doesn't know Garrett. And let's say he was hurt bad and he's like wounded or was killed. 
Garrett's going to get hammered. And, and he was life lighted out too. Yeah. I mean, he, he, they did the right thing and they got him to a burn center and, and they did all the right stuff and Garrett really cared and he really should care. And he was calling him and talking to him all the time and he was giving me updates. And I think, I think the, the thing about it is just the wrong person gets hurt at the wrong time. And that could have been a nightmare. And I've seen Garrett get scared because he knows that he's seen my, I give him examples or he saw Dave Sparks go through that with that mm -hmm. crap. And it's just a matter of time, unfortunately, that something's going to come down the pipe and let's just pray that it's not bad enough to hurt his desire and momentum to create content for everybody to enjoy, you know? Yeah. And he's got a big investment in what he's doing. I mean, I was at the Freedom Factory today and or yesterday and filmed a little just of what's going on. It's impressive. I mean, the amount of crap he has going on, the amount of employees that he's employing. I mean, I look at that as somebody who's done it for 20 years and I'm just like, this is pretty cool. And then I just tell myself, don't think about the negative. Don't think about all the, the, yeah. the, the liability and all that crap because it can consume you and uh, really run your life if you, if you let it. Um, but I think he's doing the right thing. won't take any risk because yeah. of liability. He didn't want a, he didn't want a, a t-shirt shooter. Yeah. He's worried that people could get hurt from the t-shirt shooter. Alan's been saying that for years. Right. Yeah. Alan's been a good voice to him. Alan's you know? a great business manager, yeah. partner, whatever He's been there like it. me. He's seen the stupid stuff yeah. happen. He owned yeah. a track for 10, 15 years, whatever it was, 20 years. Yeah. So he's seen a lot. So you kind of need something like that, especially when you never owned a racetrack. <sighs> You know, <laughs> it's such a dangerous thing. You know, it's not to be taken lightly. I like to mess with Garrett and get on his nerves and like act like I'm going to break and do the Freedom Factory. and do. But I never would do yeah. something that would. And and uh, if I did, I mean, on my dying bed, I, I would. There's nothing we're going to get from him. Like, this is yeah, my the own liability <laughs> bubble is huge around everything. Yeah. I mean, I was uh, we it's took crazy. out crazy. Two days ago, we took off from an airplane out of the front yard <laughs> over the racetrack. Yeah, over, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like we. <laughs> I hope he's not listening to this. I hope he's not thinking about all that, the danger. Oh, things, I mean, I'm know? sure it's causing some of his hair loss. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to cause hair loss. He's got a kid now, man. He's going to gray <laughs> up pretty quick. I love it. All you young bucks are going to gray up. Start losing. Not you. I'm getting your a hair, little bit of gray. Your hair, you'll just get gray. I won't lose it, but I'm getting a little gray. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> Hey, mine's like so like I, I started losing it like mid twenties. I remember people like, dude, you're getting thin back here. Oh, my tooth is kicked out. They're like, you're getting thin back here. And I'm like, uh, no, I'm not. It's just blonde. It's just really blonde. Oh man. Well, that's how my dad's hair. My dad has no hair. Oh yeah. Yeah, but my brother, I think, has the thin hair. And the first like one of the <laughs> one of the times my dad saw Garrett, he was like, has anybody told him he's losing his hair? Oh, no. <laughs> like, Just leave it alone, man. People are so mean like to each keeps, other. like keeps. Is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he started doing keeps, and then it was like, then he started like saying, I probably need it now. I'm like, oh, crap. You know? I always tell my wife I'll just shave it off with, yeah. with pride. I'll I just thought, be fine I thought about it. maybe doing like a, a the tattoo. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like stubble, and then just shave it all the time. So it looks like I just choose to shave. Mm -hmm. um, there's a one actor. He's like the cool guy in... Um, He's always like Jason Statham. Yeah. Statham. Jason he has Statham. the, cause I have a pretty round head, but he has, it, it's always dark. So it looks fine. You know, it looks like mm -hmm. he just shaves his head. But if I let mine grow out, oh my God, dude, it is like a chicken coop of hair. Yeah. Oh, it's so bad. <laughs> well, I give it on James too, cause James is getting like the. They're all getting there. <laughs> the you see how great JH is? <laughs> hey, by the way, message from JH. He's a little upset that you, he hasn't been on. I know. I wanted to have him on. I was honestly thinking I could put a second seat, but I wanted you to have your own. Yeah, I thought of that too, and I thought maybe selfishly. once both have their own episodes, yeah. then together all three of us would be really fun. I think you need to have big smorgasbord. Yeah, I, the only tip I give you: everybody needs a headphone because yeah. it keeps you from talking over the other people. Huh. Because when you talk, you hear yourself more, and if other people are talking, it makes you quieter. So if you hear podcasts where people are all jumbled and talking too much, they don't have headphones on. Interesting. I've never yeah. done it with the headphones on because they always just like bug me after Yeah, one-on-one -on -one is fine. But it, it keeps you from talking over other people and making a jumbled mess for the viewer. Because uh, when we are a big group of guys, we all yep. just talk and be, we don't care, right? Half the things we say, nobody even heard in the big table. But... Um, it just sounds like a jumbled mess to the, to the viewer. So that that's a good tip. If if you have more, you got to yeah. have little headphones. I want to put like little spots on each where you can plug like your own headphones into like because some people like using oh, just like a little ear pod. Totally. Ones because these I are might like have a, little... I might have a gift for you. Hmm. I'll, I'll, 
I'll send it to you 100%. I need to remember that. It's a, it, it, you build, it's built in, it pops up, and then you can plug in everything you need, charge yeah. everything, and then it pops back down out of the way. And since you made this, by yeah, the way, he, just... he's, a, he's a craftsman over here, guys. Oh, yeah. Big he, carpenter. You could, you could easily just drop it right in and then have all your connections to, if you want to put a, a screen up here to have people yep. like watch it, like with Jamie. You got a screen right there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll eventually can do that if I have like a, a person there that can run the board and then mm -hmm. somebody would sit next to you. So it'd be perfect I'll to have show, a quick run connector. the board yourself. Yeah, I could put a little board right here. It's easy. I, I, when I do it, I just switch it. I just memorize in my head. So if I'm talking too much or I need to have somebody else or somebody's talking, I'll glance down sometimes like, oh, crap. And then I'll go to their camera. Yeah. And I'll get stuck on me. Put a couple in the corners so oh, I can the get The way those things are, they record. So in post, if you did mess up pretty bad, uh, in post, you can change the angle. Hmm. And it's quick editing. And then that way you can even edit out yourself looking down. So if you have a bad habit of looking at it, you can edit it out so that the camera will change, bef like the view will change for the viewer yeah. before you put your head down, like a two seconds before. Yep. And uh, that way you can have your little camera angles. But what yeah, you got going sure. on is perfect. Like keep it simple till you have to get more Yeah, I like the simplicity. I have a bunch of other stuff I need to, I just added the arm so that you can actually tap on the table without completely transferring <laughs> all the sound. That was yeah, a, yeah, yeah. That one took me a little stuff. while to yeah. learn. <laughs> but it's, it's just kind of growing pains with this stuff. Like you got to learn as you go. Like it's tough. Like I didn't yeah. just ball out on a bunch of equipment. So I kind of just yeah. like slowly worked up to having like a. Has anybody talked? Have you talked stuff? a lot? I mean, I think people would like to hear it if you haven't. But, uh, you know, your transition working with Garrett, you know, you guys are still friends and it, it worked out. Um, did you learn a lot from that movement now doing your own thing? I mean, you have to. Have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, now you're all responsible it's, for yourself. <laughs> it's a it's a weird thing because like Garrett, I see him as a mentor, but we both went through it at same the same time, time yeah. together. Yeah. But he's just really business minded and mm. really good with that stuff. So, yeah, it was almost like a mentorship. But then I would think I'm like, wait, but this is your first time dealing with any of this stuff too. <laughs> Crap! How are you so good at time. this? <laughs> He's just really good at that yeah, stuff. Yeah, no, he is. And I learned so much from him. Like I consider it like a mentor. Yeah. And you see that operation. Mm -hmm. I couldn't stay there forever. Yeah. I would just be. Yeah. A f I would just be like lost in the shuffle. I would. Yeah. I had to kind of make the decision. Like, okay, do I get lost in a merch room? Mm. Or do I? Yeah, that's what you were doing. A lot of people don't know that. It was like 90%. That was your merch. main responsibility. And it needed a lot more attention. And it caused a lot of stress between you guys because it was a I, I saw you in a situation doing something that nobody's passionate about that, but the business needed it. Mm -hmm. And then you're in there and it's like, it's just growing pains. You know, I think you guys did it right. I think you guys genuinely are good friends still. Yeah. And you probably are better, more honest with each other now too, because in that situation, you got a lot of different mixed up things. And now you guys can just be totally hundred percent with each mm -hmm. other. Because if you, if any of us went in there and had to start doing the merch, it's not really your thing, you know? No, well, because it was like, that. <laughs> yeah, like we started this, we were like, oh, cars all the time. And yeah. then like, yeah, it kind of was rough Laughing, when I had to joking. leave Rocky Mountain Race Week mm -hmm. to go do merchandise. Oh yeah, I was like, man, yeah. this is not what I wanted to that do. Sucks. <laughs> yeah, but it's needed. It's it's, it's and I did millions it. of dollars, and that's why I did it. Yeah, I was like, well, I better get yeah. on the flight and head out. And yeah. it is what it is. Like you yeah. do what a business needs. Like I used to have film. We would film like you know nine a.m. to five o'clock, like working on cars, and then five o'clock to midnight was Merch. fulfilling merchandise Fill orders. orders. Ugh. And it's like, what it's a grind. the least glamorous job ever. Oh, it's terrible. It's such a grind. I only enjoy it because I get to gift my friends stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, now I'm getting the merch back in my house, so I'm going to send a whole bunch out now that I'm getting it back to my house and yeah. I can send it out myself. But it was kind of a pain. It was really it was really kind of a pain to send stuff out to people. I've revamped mine. I got a bunch of new stuff printed. You got to see this one. You're going to get a yeah. kick out of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually, have you showed people this one yet? I haven't, but they probably have seen it by now. This is plant more I trees. I love it. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and then the front has the recycling logo with my. <laughs> So you know, I'm the trying plant, to do that's some more. awesome too. I think the plant more trees, if we had somebody like we we're talking with the EPA that was like running the show mm -hmm. and that we really get behind somebody, please step up out there. The, the group that was out there, I don't think they're the right people. They've kind of shown that they're not. Um, but I think if somebody did take that on, that could be like, well, every a dollar goes to that, goes to keeping the racetracks alive. I know. And get Garrett to do it and everybody. And that could be a lot of good money coming I've, out for that. I've talked to my wife a lot about 
trying to kind of become that beacon of that'd be you know, awesome like, if you did. It's, it kind of sucks because like it doesn't I'm in the position where I can mm-hmm. have a following mm-hmm. I'm young enough where I can actually maybe see a change yeah I'm smart enough I think to actually Help. have a conversation like with right. somebody that's intelligent yeah and not just be like well we're gonna street race then if you take down the track <laughs> yeah because that's not the right angle to no, approach with a threat yeah and I saw people <laughs> do that when we were at I know people at, would come up court. there and be like we're going to cause more car accidents if you close the track. I'm like, right. that, you don't threat. Like, you yeah, don't. it's not really the best angle. Uh, like, that's There's a, a way better angle. It's a bad <laughs> angle. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, there, I think it, it would be, it would be great for the community, but it's almost like you got to dedicate your life for it to really make an impact. You got to fall on the sword. And if you really enjoy it, then, then do it. I mean, but I think, uh, it, you're definitely going to have to commit your, your life to it to really make an impact. Mm-hmm. And, you will be a hero amongst friends in our group, but it's not going to bring that much glory to you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you're not going to get much pats on the back other than the people around you, but it's, uh, it's, and it's not going to give you any money directly. You, It'd have to be just from this stuff. You have to be prepared to not have an impact till potentially you're already gone. <laughs> true. Like that, you have true. to be prepared to have an impact that may not be felt <laughs> in your lifetime. But when you're dead. <laughs> yeah, man, that Cooper was amazing. For yeah, the exactly. It's weird because you got to kind of fall on the sword in you a do. way. You it, do. It's kind of like announcing almost at a track. Like you, you have to just be up there the whole day, out of the group, out of not hanging out, not with buddies. talking to your friends, not racing your own car. Like, right? There's so much respect to people that do that because mm-hmm. that's like the. Yeah. It sounds cool on paper. We need it, and we need yeah. it, and yeah. we all love the announcers. Yeah. But I know you can't be doing it like. Uh, uh, yeah, Savage been doing it, um, but then the what's the last guy? What, I keep forgetting his name always, and I'm friends with him, Jared. Jared? Yeah, Jared, who does the. Uh, he's FD. incredible. He's yep. so good at it. But you don't see he golfs. He's not out ripping cars. It's yep. almost the right recipe. Like he has his passion. You need to love it, but not like want to be in it because you're gonna hate being up in that booth because you're gonna want to get out there and race. Yeah, and all he wants to do is drink beers and go golfing. You know, that's and be a good dad. That's his whole life, right? So, well, even like with Spencer, (laughs) like I kind of feel that he wants to be a little bit more participating in it. And yeah, I I, nobody's gonna blame you for feeling that. I know, of course, he wants to do a burnout or yeah, and it's just part of it. That's why I think the person to lead the APA challenge needs to be almost a lawyer, a lawyer, real, a real lawyer that wants to make a name for himself in that world and is willing to help out this community and stand up for us because mm-hmm. he not necessarily wants to race cars and everything every day. Maybe he has a Corvette in his garage, right? Or something cool like that. But then yeah. he just loves and respects it enough that he can make a, a, a living from it, fighting this stuff. And, uh, Guys like us can have somebody to really get behind and donate money to, to help him with the legal stuff and getting experts. Because you need experts. You, yeah. need, you need all this crap to come in to support your movement, to prove it to these other people that want to develop the community and win at those little meetings and all that well, stuff. Well, that was my thought. I was like, okay, like tomorrow I could start a merchandise company. Mm-hmm. Just right. car guys versus the EPA. Right. Everything right. we sell goes to... right. Month, but like, what do you do with the money? You get okay, so you have a hundred. You got to make a living too. You have a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> in your hands. What do you do with that money then? I think you do it to like, let's say for Gary. You hire a lawyer, or yeah. a law team, or a big enough law firm yep. that and you can just keep pouring expensive. money into. Yep, and hope that they can take down Papa government and fight. That's why he needs to be a lawyer, I think, because that's his job and that's what he can do and make a living at it, right? And then you're not giving it to a third party lawyer to do stuff because they never mm-hmm. do a great job. They never do, trust me. Um, they just like their paycheck uh, and if it's not their passion. So yeah. I think a lawyer that is into it enough that says, I'm new, young enough, I want to make an impact in something in this world and I and I understand what their fight is, I'm going to get involved in it and uh, then guys like us can have our, we can give contributions to him and then that $100,000 you're talking about, I can quickly think of stuff that, that they could use that for, be like finding experts to come in and, and yeah. go to court and talk and um, you know, show our side of it and show the impact to our societies that we need something like that and we are a grandfathered in 
fabric of society and we need to be protected. We cannot go by the wayside. Like we have mm -hmm. to fight, you know? Well, uh, that's why I was saying like, if I built a merchandise company, you know, yeah. keep doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. And then just a side project right. of something that people would get behind because it would grow on its own, I think. I think so too, yeah. If you have something that's just all merchandise, just car guys mm -hmm. for the, against the EPA car guy. That well, and you would have a forum to have him on and talk about what progress he's making. Yeah. And you can keep tabs on it that way and the people could check in. So, I mean, you could create something. I just think you would need a guy doing it full time and that'd be uh, his, happened. that'd be his, his deal. Full, full memory card? I don't know. No space. Cool. Okay. Hey, at least you caught it. Buddy, list a couple of the cars I have listed. I have a Corvette I'm selling. Yeah. And he's just overwhelmed. Because <laughs> I posted trying to find it. them all. No, I posted it and now he's just overwhelmed with all the calls. And oh, like, uh, I, yeah, I tell the, posted a bunch. I didn't tell the people uh, that it wasn't my number. And he's like, I am getting the craziest phone call. <laughs> so, whatever happened with your lightning that you had? That one that got crashed? Dude, I just got paid on it. Did I made they? Money. I'm. I imagine, like, when I saw that, I was like, they're never fixing that. No. At first, so if people don't know, I was out here hanging out. Um, I have a an assistant, you know, that helps me with a lot of stuff. When I, I really am not as busy anymore, so it's just kind of a luxury to have her. Well, she was getting her oil changed. I said, yeah, just drive that truck. Everything else is kind of a work in progress, or it's yeah. weird, it's quirky, you Take know? Take the brand new electric <laughs> F-150 Brand Ford new, Lightning. the Platinum. I got it for MSRP. And nobody had them at that time. Nobody had it, and I'm doing videos with it. I'm making content. I jumped it. I was like, I'm going to launch this thing. I'm going to end the big. When I get 100,000 followers, I was going to drive it underwater with side-by-side -side blog. Mm -hmm. we, we, we have a, they have the big area. I helped them finance that um, big property they have so was, we're gonna dig a trench pour in some fresh water and that same day drive it underwater and yep. maybe have an event and have a big celebration you know like and just drive this truck underwater so uh i'm out here messing around messing with that camaro that i got that 90 camaro with the supercharger on it yep <laughs> and uh she calls me blowing me up i finally asked her what she goes you're gonna kill me and it wasn't her fault man she stopped at a stop sign waiting to come out and traffic was going this way and she was stopped. The guy came creaning out of control, broke through a street sign, and smashed into the side of her. All the airbags deployed except the front. Uh, she had her two little girls with her, um, and everybody was okay. But people don't know, my assistant, six foot eight, played for the WNBA. <laughs> so she has quite a big torso, and now she's got back problems. Uh. And uh, she's been in therapy, getting help for a long since that happened. Now getting it worked out, so she has quite the big uh, lawsuit because I have very, very good insurance. So mm -hmm. she's going to make some decent money. I told well, her that was make, probably a relatively safe car to crash in. Oh, too. it was super. It was super safe too. compared to and, yeah. others. Yeah, and getting hit directly on the side like that. The battery, uh, right? It under could have been really bad if it was like an older normal car. She would have yeah. been. She would have been hurt really bad, especially her seating position. So she had the whiplash and all that stuff. I told her, if you make like a million bucks from this thing, you better buy me a truck as a gift. <laughs> you owe me a terrible <laughs> F-150 yeah. that cost way too much. Way too damn much. I, I enjoy driving it, but yeah, the, the cost is astronomical. It's such a stupid thing. Oh man, the it's videos so that dumb. movie did on them. <laughs> I don't know if you saw any, but he tried uh -huh. to tow with it and it got like, oh yeah, yeah. Terrible. Like 20 miles before it needed to be I plugged know. in. I did one too. I, he had the small battery pack. So his was terrible. I did, <laughs> I did mine with my bit. boat and I drove it across town with the boat and back and it got 160 mile range. And this is what I'll say till whatever. I wish battery stuff was not political. It's terrible that it is because in reality, there's a need for it and there's a really good use for the battery stuff. 
-hmm. and I loved driving it every day. The, the, the center of gravity is lower, so it's less trucky, you know, when you go around corners and stuff and that behaved really well, a ton of power. It's just not set up to be a tow truck in any capacity, because if you got, unless you're towing around town, I could see a landscaper doing a few jobs every day yeah. and not driving more than 150 miles in his range. He could have a, he could have a trailer and do his thing every day, charge it every night and not spend a dollar in gas. I mean, you could really do that easy, yeah. but if you have to charge, you have to unplug, you have to unhook your trailer, go back into a spot or whatever, and then charge for however long it's not designed for that. But Absolutely as like a normal run around truck, it was incredible, man. I loved it. So uh, insurance tried to say they were going to fix it for a while. After I thought when, uh, I'm going to take out my hillbilly tooth. Yeah, that's fine. When, when, Leave it on the table. <laughs> when, when, uh, I'll just throw it back in later. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> when uh, insurance, they're like, I go, the airbag's deployed. Isn't that a total? No, they'll fix airbag deployed cars. I had no idea. I'm like, so now I'm going to get a car with airbag deployment a on the car fax? With the T-bone, I was like, you're going to fix that truck, drop it off in front of my house. It was worth over $100,000 when it got crashed. Now that when you drop it off, it's going to be worth 70000 with the big crash and the airbag deployment. Maybe. If I try, yeah. try to sell it on the open. Yeah, only because the market's good for them still, right? Yeah. So they're like, you can go after the car guy that hit you. He was a convicted felon on a warrant, had a warrant for his arrest. He ran away. They ended up catching him. He had no insurance. The car hadn't had registration for two years. He'd been driving around for two mm -hmm. years with an unregistered, no insurance for two years. And I was just talking to the lawyer about like, we need to at least file something against him. So if he thinks he can get away with this scot-free or just, you know, um, go to jail for a little bit, he needs to have this financial burden put on his plate. You know, like the guy needs to learn a lesson because he hasn't learned it yet. So I'm kind of trying to see if there's any leeway there. Cause I don't need the money, but I need to, I want to financially, um, tie him to his crime. I mean, yeah. he almost killed him. So that if he tries to like get anything else. Yeah, if he like tries to fix, he needs to have a really, uh, uh, a good learning process. Cause obviously whatever's happening wasn't working. You yeah. know, the guy was still a criminal driving around every day. So, um, but yeah, so then they tried to pay me uh, like a depreciated truck. They tried to pay me 80 grand. Mm -hmm. So with my background now legal, I bought them pretty good and I got paid 114 after all said and done with tax. So I made a little bit of money actually on it, thank God. Yeah, and you got to get rid of that thing at a high point. Too. Oh, at a high point. Because they have to value it at the time I got the wreck. Yeah. So now things are lower now. They've been having battery issues yep. and some other stuff. So now they kind of um, got some bad publicity in exactly. a bunch of ways. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. not a bad deal. So yeah. to end it off there, yeah. I'm curious, like, how do you, you know, when we met you, you were kind of like, you were a little more wild, I feel like. <laughs> how how do you like how do you live your life now? What's your like plans? Where are you like what are you trying to do? Are you just trying to have fun? Or are you just trying to like go on Rocky Mountain race weeks and have fun where you want to? Like what is your kind of like thoughts on that deal? I'm kinda in that transition, man. I'm kinda retired. Belize runs itself. It's not very big now. I don't have a big operation going on anymore, but we still run that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Um so that that you know pays the bills, right? Um and then I'm a professional gambler now. <laughs> That's what I say. So really, I'm, you were an amateur when I last saw you in Vegas. So you were I'm just not losing money. <laughs> so I'm not. <laughs> there's a lot of losing. There's a lot of losing, Cooper. But there's the wins that I don't show all. No, I show every win. I don't show the losses. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my mom's like, she. I let her track me. She's like, oh yeah, you're you at the office today. I'm like, yeah, I'm at the casino. Yeah, yeah. That's our lingo. Yeah, that's I'm the at, office. Because I mean, I'll do really well, man. I've made. 40 grand a night the other night. I made 40 grand, but mm -hmm. I lost 10 grand two nights in a row, you know, but it, that's just for fun. If it gets out of control, I, I really, I really will. Won't, won't go anymore. Florida sucks for casinos. Dude, the town, I like the Tampa hard rock, but that's all it's got. That's it. That's it. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. That's it. There's that's where, else. that's where the libertarian in me is like, well, why can't we have more casinos? <laughs> I agree. Freaking I think government. drugs should be legal too. Yeah. <laughs> You know, <laughs> take away that whole market. Take, you can legalize the them. It's not going to change anything what I do. Uh, not me either. I'm <laughs> so <good>. it's like, <laughs> not going to affect my day. But no, I think um, I, I, I'm taking a break right now. People might have been waiting to hear why I haven't been filming. Uh, one, I lost my camera guy. Two, um, I need to get my body fixed. All this fun stuff I've been doing in my life. I have not had a primary doctor in 15 years. So I've had bad degenerative uh, issues with my shoulders. Um, I'm sick of talking about it personally. 
So I'm finally getting this one replaced on Wednesday, a full reverse shoulder replacement. So it'll be all yeah. cyborg underneath. Have you looked at a stem cell stuff? Have you I done tried that? that. Yeah. It, it, it's uh, bone on bone, the bone smashed in, mm. and it's just like basically just grinded out my whole socket. Yeah, it's I've so seen bad. so much promise with that stuff. And it's like, good if you catch it early yeah. and you keep doing it because it'll keep healing. I'm trying it. to convince my mom to do that on like a disc in her back. Yeah. Like early. Enough. I would try. I would try, especially if it's not. I don't see it regrowing a cartilage and making the socket well again. You got to get it before that, before arthritis sets in. But uh, yeah, it definitely can help. I almost invested big in that, but I, I just didn't have the time. So that, my other shoulder needs to get done. My knee is still broken from that car accident, the, the Tesla wreck I got in. Yeah. Uh, I fractured my knee in that and tore my ACL. So I have no ACL, which you can relate. You understand that world. So. I've been walking on it with a torn ACL, so it's a little unstable if I try to do stuff. So I can't really do much at the gym either. And I'm a very physical fitness type person. The, when everybody kind of got to know me, I was kind of being lazy. And and then now I've been hurt so bad I can't get in shape. So that's the goal. Mentally, physically get in shape again, feel good about myself. And then uh, I got a lot of cool cars that I've been buying because that hasn't stopped. Uh, to make some really cool, fun videos and then come out guns blazing, shooting videos till the day I die, maybe. I don't know. I, I really enjoy the video stuff. I think um, people like it for whatever reason. Yeah. And I just got to get a new camera guy that I really like. Because, I mean, Cody was cool. We could hang out and have a good time. And, uh, you know, for the most part, I liked hanging out with him. That was a big deal. Yeah. Um, and not that, like, other people I've been around, I don't like them, but I, like, I want to be able to call them. And I still call Cody and show him the stupid stuff I buy, you know? Like, most people would think I'd be mad at him because he left. Um, but I still, like, relate. You know, we talk about the dumb car stuff. He's like, yeah. told me what tires I should probably get for the other thing I bought, you know? So uh, I think that's kind of where I want to go in my later part of my life is just shoot some fun videos. It makes good money. You can make good money, especially if you can sell the merch. And I have the, I have the financial ability to buy a really cool car and put it up for a uh, you know, giveaway. That truck I gave away was literally just, I had it, I fixed it up because I like to fix stuff up. It was wrecked. And I was like, oh, let's give it away. And yeah. it, it generated a lot of money for what I do. And I was like, dude, I couldn't make this money doing anything else selling a truck like that. And it opens a lot of doors that are yeah. really cool and like collaborative yeah. with oh, people, 100%. which is like something that you wouldn't normally get. Yeah. And I like this group. A lot of my friends that I grew up with are married and they're not sticks in the mud, but they have a different life. I've never been married. I have my daughter and we have a good time, but like, I don't, I don't, when you get married, you kind of, and have kids and you get older, it's just kind of, that's all you do. Yeah. You know, if you're a good dad and mom, that's all you do is your family, you know? And then everything else kind of fades off. This group was younger and go getter. And I really love that energy that you guys all have of that drive in life. And I'm still in that world. Like I still like to do that stuff. I'm not, you know, fat and married and don't care anymore and just all about my daughter and her swim team like yeah. i have a lot of time still yeah you get to go on sick weeks and race yeah. weeks and yeah. enjoy 100%. the car stuff and, that. and i'm financially good mm -hmm. so i i don't need to get on the grind and make money which is a, an ideal situation to be in for videos i can i can i mean i've lost quite a bit of money uh filming and the car world is the best to be in i, I mean, love it it's i love freaking it greatest group of I, people i can't wait for it to be my primary source of income i i ride off way more i have so many losses i i have no income yeah. from this you know i can't wait till i can make enough and start paying taxes in this world and then i know i won't need any air ambulance stuff that stuff can i, I built belize to have belizeans run it and I'm staying true to that, where eventually I'll exit, basically, and let the country run itself if I can create a good enough system. Okay. And that's the goal for them. And then I can just do the videos and have a good time. So, like, I did, and I and a lot of the fun videos, I did love the Missing Donald Walters, the series I did. Yep. That was random, but it, it fits my personality pretty well. And then um, I have a fun video coming out. I'll give, I'll give the guys a little taste. I bought a 2000... Dodge Durango show truck, <laughs> full body kit on spinners. Nice. Full hydraulics. It'll hop. It has an insane stereo system. I bought it on cars and bids for yep. eight grand. <laughs> I, it's got four wheel awesome. drive and the video isn't going to be whatever. It's going to be, I took my, <laughs> my show winning hydraulic Dodge Durango four wheel driving. 
sounds like an early like pimp my ride car. It I exactly. look for those all the time. I'm like, man, where they're are all hilarious. those cars? It's, I want one of those. They're all destroyed. Tavarish has one. He has the oh, minivan really? from there. And oh, it was like, it was in bad shape. Remember, they would have like a a full like cooking like a the car like make hot dogs in the back. Like they're the dumbest. Thing. And they would take the worst cars too. They would be like. <laughs> You had a, a Saturn Sky, so we modified it to be. Yeah, they don't care. <laughs> the, the producers all just wanted something funny to they show. They don't care guys. about the car. Yeah. But yeah, so I have that. I think that would be a fun one. I've got a cool JDM right hand drive uh, Mitsubishi Pajero Evo I just bought. Uh, I, have, uh, I have a lot of cool stuff. I just bought the new Rivian um, SUV. Yeah, I was going to say this. That's a fun one. I, I like daily driving electric. You know, yeah. for my needs, it's that Rivian's it's awesome. nice too. It seems it's like a, a nice really car. nice vehicle, and it's not Tesla. They did a good job <laughs> on that for their first attempt. It's amazing for their first attempt, like first ever. That they, dude, they were smart that with dude it. is uh, going to be successful. Yeah. and they're into uh, all the manufacturer. They have big trucks for Amazon, so they're a big supplier of that right now. Yep, and that to, is off the public eye. That's going to make them their their be their stable ground that they can build a cool car for the masses. Mm -hmm. And I think they're going to do well. I think they've had a little struggle, but I just bought a ton of their stock. It's down right now. I think good time to buy yeah, them. Good time to buy. Yeah, yeah. I bought a ton of Tesla too. I think they're going to be a monster, which they already are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I like to do all that, but we can, we could, I'll come back. I'll try to bring uh, JH after he's come on. He yeah. was a little butt hurt that you haven't called him. I said, well, Salty not JH. a lot of people like you, JH. They may say that to your face. Yeah. And like, I'm even saying it to you right now. But I'll tell you, I don't like you. Well, you the know? JH Who thing I invented, so. <laughs> you did? That was me. I got a sticker made for the mystery machine one year. <laughs> and I, I just, it was really? like a middle of the no night idea. thing. I called up Chris at Project Prime. I was like, hey, can you get me a JH Who sticker for this weekend? It was like two days away. And we both like, Because <laughs> everyone was like, who? Who is this guy? He's the freaking hillbilly Shrek neighbor that runs the swamp. And, and nobody like, knows that. And it was just kind of like the insult, like, oh, who? That guy that keeps blowing up his burnout car? <laughs> <laughs> he freaking... So. Uh, Dude, he, he's such a... First day I met him was the day he rolled in the pond with me. I got in. I was like, this is cool. Ten seconds later, we're in a pond upside down. I'm like, yeah. thank God I know kind of this feeling of being upside down. It's the first time in water, I'd rolled a lot of vehicles. Mm -hmm. So I was like, was I you knew what the to savage. do. <laughs> yeah, had savage in the back. Uh, we didn't... Yeah, we knew what to do to get out, but it was... <laughs> yeah. I couldn't believe how deep the pond was. That was a bad deal. I love that he tried to destroy Garrett's... Van, the little K van. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I started that, me and uh, RG. Yeah, you said you'd buy it from I him. did. I gave him money. <laughs> There's the video of me paying. Me and RG gave him our cash and bought the van in that moment. And we're like, let's run it over. Because he was sitting out back. You know how he is. Like, mm -hmm. he's got people have no idea the amount of gems he has Just scattered random things that I don't even know about. Mm -hmm. You know, but yeah, he had a lot back then too, like we all do. And uh, yeah, we paid him to drive it. And he's like peer pressured by the whole party. Do it, run it over, run it over. And he's like, I love it though, I like it. We're like, we'll give you money. He's like, fine. That pond sucked that <laughs> truck up instantly. Gone. Couldn't even see it. I was like, holy crap. I thought oh this thing was God. like, you know, five feet deep. It was so great. I mean, my family was like, who are you hanging out with? What are you doing? I just broke up with my girlfriend at the time. I was like, I'm having a great time in Florida, man. <laughs> you almost like, died. Man, I'm really worried about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. We'll end it off there. You'll awesome. be back on. We'll have JH or Garza or well, something. Well, now I know where you live. The other chair. Yeah, now you know where I live. Yeah. Hopefully you come back a little bit more, maybe move to Florida or something. But um, where can we, they find you to follow you? Oh, oh. Uh, well, chill, I'm Uncle Chet is my Instagram. Okay. I have a chill with Chet. You guys follow that too. But I, I, I need another person to help me run. the. I don't do well bouncing around. So I'm Uncle Chet is my best Instagram. Uh, the YouTube channels. Um, hey, man. I mean, if I'm not filming, you guys can still subscribe. And Go get watch some of the old videos if you've They're never really watched good. it too. Yeah. There's a lot that a lot of people never saw. There's only like 10,000 views back then. Yeah. And I, they've all been good from day one till then. The production value that Cody and yep. I put into it, it's really good stuff. It, it, it's not like time sensitive. Like a lot of the vlogging is time sensitive. So a lot of my videos, you can go back and watch them, and they're 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 great. They're yeah. still fun and you'll enjoy and it. Current, yeah. So that's uh, chilling with Chet um, on YouTube. On YouTube, I have uh, you know if you want to ever buy merch and stuff on there, but if you want to save your merch buying for the next giveaway, uh, I'm definitely gonna come out guns blazing when I get fixed up with some good videos. 
content and I'll have some pretty crazy giveaway stuff too. Heck so. yeah. Good deal, man. Well, thank That's you for it. coming on. That was awesome. We'll have him back. If you guys have any questions for next time, put them in the uh, comments down below. But that's going to do it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Keep it saucy. We'll see you next time. Keep it saucy. <laughs> that was awesome, buddy. Dude, thank you for coming on.